Good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Amy Blum. I am the Chief Operating Officer for the National Gaucher Foundation, and we are so thrilled to have you all here, physically present, as well as the many others who are turning in, tuning into the meeting today, virtually through our Facebook live stream. So welcome to everyone. We have a very packed schedule today with lots of incredible information to share with you. So I'm going to start right away by introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Gregory Grabowski. Dr. Grabowski received his MD from the University of Minnesota, where he also completed his residency in pediatrics and fellowship training in human genetics. He then established his research in institution before moving to New York City and the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in 1979. Over the next 13 and a half years, he developed the world's largest clinic for patients affected with Gaucher disease and other lysosomal diseases. Dr. Grabowski established basic research and diagnostic laboratories for genetic diseases as well as the first treatment center for enzyme therapy in Gaucher disease. He was recruited to Cincinnati, where he was the A. Graham Mitchell Chair of Human Genetics and Director of Human Genetics at the Children's Hospital Research Foundation, as well as a professor in the Departments of Molecular Genetics and Biochemistry and Pediatrics at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. During his research career, he has published over 340 scholarly works on the basic and clinical sciences of lysosomal storage and genetic diseases, while maintaining an active clinical and treatment programs in gen genetic diseases. He has continuously served on committees of the National Institute of Health, the, Na the national and state governments, and many philanthropic and fa patient foundations, including serving on the Medical Advisory Board of the National Gaucher Foundation. Since June of 2015, he holds the positions of Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics and Genetics at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Research Foundation, is a consultant for and or a member of scientific advisory boards for both several, for several biotech companies and is the chief scientific officer for Kniska Pharmaceuticals. I welcome you and I now present Dr. Gregory Grabowski. All right, good morning. And it's, uh, I think it's great to be back in New York, although it took me two and a half hours to get from JFK to my hotel yesterday <laughs> afternoon. I have a feeling it might take me longer to get to the airport tonight. Uh, and hopefully my plane will leave. But it is great to be here. It's great to see many old friends. And I do mean older friends. And that's important because you're here. And it's, it's great to see you. And what I'd like to do today is I'm going to talk to you about something that's really quite cutting edge in this uh, disease we call Gaucher disease. And I'm going to give you a little background on how we got to this position and how, we, how we're going to move forward on this. But this is really very new material. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about mice because there's some things we're allowed to do in mice that we cannot do in humans, and they become important. So these are my connections, and I always put this up here because, shall we say, I think you all know who this refers to, but this, the, this disease is very complicated, very intertwined with how we live and feel and how it causes the disorder it does. These are some of the positions that uh, I'm currently involved with. The one I left off of here is that I usually put as second, which is my mother and father gave me startup funds. Um, but I work with a number of companies uh, in, in their activities, and uh, it's been really an educational experience for me 
and all different areas and therapeutic areas related to uh, rare diseases. So I'm going to start with some lessons, lessons that we've learned over the last 25 or 30 years about lysosomal diseases, and in particular, Gaucher disease. The assumption was that protein replacement, enzyme therapy, and uh, protein supplementation enhancement could or should correct the disease at its origin. This is fundamentally true because those people that don't have defects in these proteins or enzymes are fine. But then if that is true, why do we have therapies and not cures? And that's because we really don't understand enough. We need to move beyond the, what do we need to do to move beyond the significant but somewhat limited effects of therapy to really, to the total restoration of health? The other lessons are here. At the beginning, we, had, we didn't really care to understand or didn't understand fully the lysosome, which is the central organelle involved in Gaucher disease, and its function. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of that so that this isn't so opaque. And we, have a poor, we still have a poorly detailed idea of what happens in time and in space in the body. And this is important because all these different organs that are involved in Gaucher disease are tied together and they change differently at different times, whether it's your spleen, your liver, bone, or maybe even the brain. And we really had very little appreciation for some of the immune problems that are involved in Gaucher disease. Now, hopefully this will work well. So this is sort of where we come. There's this overproduction of immune molecules that really make your body change. Large liver, large spleen, your belly gets big, your bones change. They can even fracture as we move through this. And then we came up with this magnificent molecule that has this little thing on the end, which is a tag, and we put it in the bloodstream. And it runs around, and it finds itself directly going to these macrophages, which we call Gaucher cells. And it, just like the space station, it docks, it gets internalized, and it fixes what's going on in the cell. And it reduces this to normal cells with partial reversal of the effects of Gaucher disease. A lot of this that I showed you after we put this in the arm is magic. We really don't understand some of the details that happen as we put this enzyme into the body and it gets into these macrophages to make things better. And this is what we've started to think about when we look at what is happening. Now, I'm going to show you three or four very complicated slides, and they are meant to be uh, complicated, not to put you off, but to bring you in to the complexity that we have to deal with in this disease. And the reason this is, we used to call Gaucher disease a lysosomal storage disease. Some of us are trying to move to the concept of the greater lysos lysosomal system diseases because of the following. In 1983 or thereabouts, Christian de Duve came to Mount Sinai School of Medicine. He is the man who got a Nobel Prize for the discovery of lysosomes and their function. And I asked him as a junior faculty member, why do we have lysosomes? Why do we have these lysosomes inside the body, inside cells? And he thought for a minute and he said, so we don't have to live in our food we can take it with us. Now, if you think about that, what's happening right now, you eat food, things go into your body. You're not sitting here swimming around in nutrients, but things are happening in your body. Your insulin changes, your glucose changes, your lipids change. All these things are going on dynamically, and that is really based on lysosomal function. And here's the first of the complicated slides. Up here, we have when you have increased nutrients, like we have now, the lysosome does things that it didn't do before. 
there's a compound that sits on a lysosomal membrane that shuts off, making more lysosomes. It shuts off finding where other nutrients are, and it increases things in your body that will help store fats and sugars and so forth and help digest it, so it adapts. But what happens when you're starving or under stress? This molecule that had sat on the lysosome comes off, you make more lysosomes, you increase the amount of fat that you burn up, and you increase something, some proteins that are involved in how, what is called autophagy. Autophagy means you eat yourself. So if you're starving, you have to eat yourself. And it does this. And the person who described this got a Nobel Prize last year. It shuts off making fats and making uh, steroids and other kinds of things. So this is a central core in modulating metabolism through the body. And this is important. So it's not just something sitting there waiting for something to happen. It is actively involved. Many of you have complained to me about fatigue, about low energy. It's all part of this system. And we hadn't appreciated it before. Now, the initiators of Gaucher disease is the lack of the enzyme in the body and in the storage of the material that is there. But then what happens after initiation? When you first start out with the disease, it's pretty simple. You're pretty normal except for a few little things that are there. But as things go on, things become much more complicated. So we have a relatively simple beginning, that which we call initiation. And then, just like an airplane, the body tolerates and adapts to certain deviations from normal. And it can handle it. And you've all been in airplanes, and the plane goes, Whoa. but you're hoping it doesn't go wrong, because then it's gone. You lose control, and the control systems are gone. So here we can tolerate these normal, these deviations, these minor deviations. And then we have the evolution in a, in a timed way of increasing complexity. And we start to engage other parts of this disease and other parts of lysosomal function into creating more and more complex abnormalities. If you read the literature that some of you are part of, from the beginning of enzyme therapy, you will see that uh, there are statements that you cannot treat the bone disease in Gaucher. It's untreatable. That's because the initial patients we had had gone too far, sorry, had gone too far with their disease process, and they are now into an irreversible stage. Now I'm going to try my little... So here we are again. The monocytes occur in bone marrow. They come out of bone marrow and they get distributed to various tissues in the body. And they become macrophages and eventually they become Gaucher cells and they're all different in different tissues. And the macrophage continues to eat things that it's supposed to. It's a big eater. But in Gaucher disease, it stores lipid and it can't get rid of it and it throws out all these red compounds that are these immunological molecules. And what do they do? They increase your metabolism. They increase your, your level of fatigue. They, they tell your body to eat more. It continues to move on and self-propagate itself. So it becomes a very, very self-propagating disease with all these manifestations that we talked about. But part of that is this system that I showed you here and how the lysosome is disrupted. And then the next thing that happens is this disruption of the entire cellular system that controls energy in your body creates an immune response. And this immune response can lead to three things down here. Fancy terms, pyroptosis, apoptosis, and necroptosis. These are different ways that your body can kill cells. And they do it in a programmed manner. And this is all regulated through the lysosomal function. So this is the beginning. It looks like, in many parts of Gaucher disease, 
this part called necroptosis is active. But it becomes more complicated, and this is the piece that's brand new and becomes important. There's a little molecule here called C5A. This is a component of the immune system that says there's danger there. We have to fight this off. And it ties into this system here that I just showed you. And this becomes self-propagating. This C5A is complement 5. It attaches to a receptor. It changes the nature of what's going on in cells, enhances all of these activities, and engages the entire immune system in saying, there's something wrong with this body, and we have to get rid of it. And that getting rid of it are the Gaucher cells. So it's this axis that controls glucoceramin, the essential lipid that's involved in Gaucher disease, its accumulation and tissue inflammation in Gaucher disease. So I'm going to talk to you about mice. And like I said, we're going to talk about mice because we can do things in them that we can't do in humans. And we have some models that are sort of like Gaucher disease in humans, but not exactly. So we have this particular mouse here who has mutations in the Gaucher gene. It's got Gaucher cells and has all kinds of abnormalities in the tissues related to the immune system. And these red things keep coming out of the cells called cytokines. This is potentially the most important slide. We are able to take a particular molecule that will kill the Gaucher enzyme in all cells of the body. It's called CBE, chondroitin B epoxide, made by a friend of mine, Gunter Legler, in the 70s. Very powerful agent, kills glucose reversidase, the enzyme in Gaucher disease in all cells of the body. And we can do this in a timed way. So we can take wild-type mice, give them this stuff, and see what happens. And what happens is, this is so is the survival. Over time, and these are days, we inject this stuff on a daily basis, we give it, and the mice die, and by 30 days, they're all dead. What do they die of? They die of certain kinds of visceral but neurologic disease. So these are Gaucher mice created with this inhibitor. We can also do this in some mice that have genetic abnormalities with Gaucher. Then we can get rid of this compound that I said was the receptor for C5A, and look what happens. They live. Okay. They live. And they live till we stop the experiment. That's amazing. Now, why would they possibly do that? Why would this molecule here that's involved with complement, which is way down the pathway from uh, the inciting event in Gaucher actually live? What causes that? And there are a whole bunch of abnormalities here that we can show that go away when uh, we treat and get rid of this receptor. All these abnormalities are part of Gaucher disease. But the most amazing part was here. This shows the lipid, glucoceramid, that accumulates in Gaucher disease. When you get rid of this receptor, this goes away. That's not enzyme therapy. This is a totally different pathway. How could this be? And what we found was the following. In either wild-type mice, where we, get, where we get rid of this receptor pharmacologically, or in Gaucher-like mice, where we get rid of this receptor pharmacologically, the enzyme that makes the lipid involved in, uh, in Gaucher disease goes away. It's diminished. The complement system is regulating the production of glucoceramid. So this is totally different than enzyme therapy. And these mice live. So what we have here is a downregulation of this enzyme that makes glucoceramid, the offending enzyme initially, or 
offending lipid initially. And then whatever enzymes left can work on whatever comes through and you decrease the disease. And if you measure the amount of glucose ceramid in these mice, in their tissues, it's near normal. So this is totally and completely a different pathway. So surprising finding. And it gets a little more complicated. And this is where we need still to do a lot of work and how this may have impact as we move forward in different kinds of therapies and go shade disease. So this is all part of a paper that was published in February. And what this shows is the initial event is your Gaucher cell. You're missing an enzyme or a lot of it, and you accumulate glucose ceramid. And then something quite, some, quite amazing happens. So in addition to this C5A that we talked about, your body sees your, this lipid, glucose ceramid, as foreign. And it says, I'm going to make an antibody to this and get rid of it. So this becomes an autoimmune disease. And it's to the Gaucher lipid. And that antibody then does several things. It's complexed with glucose ceramid and only glucose ceramid. It attaches to certain kinds of macrophages and enhances their activity. It increases glucose ceramid activity. It also gets out into the bloodstream, enhances the production of this complement, which then can circle back into the cell, and you create this vicious cycle of enhancement of activity, increased production of glucose ceramid, and the propagation of Gaucher disease. And it makes it worse. So this is why we move from the initiating event here to a far more complicated system of understanding how Gaucher disease actually causes the propagation of the illness and leads to ongoing damage. From these events, we don't know how these are connected yet to some of the fibrosis that occurs or some in, in tissues, to some of the abnormalities in bone that occur, but this is a lead-in to how we could start to understand this. And to understand how this complement system and the receptor in particular regulates glucose ceramid becomes incredibly important in understanding this at a biological level. So, the next question is, what do you care? Why would it matter to you? Well, because this is an important axis in the development of glucose ceramid and, and metabolism, that's important. It modulates glucose ceramid synthase, which is the enzyme that is attacked with these drugs called substrate reduction drugs. It tips the balance in glucose ceramid metabolism, and therefore Gaucher disease, and controls the, the bad accumulation of this in Gaucher. This is a controlling event. We can target this axis with a drug, and it abolishes glucose ceramid without any other therapy in mice. And it gets rid of the auto-inflammatory parts of this. So it decreases the inflammation, all those red dots flying all over and glucose ceramid itself. The question is, is this a target for an additive, alternative, or additional therapy to block the inflammatory responses in Gaucher disease in certain patients or in certain indications? And is this associated with malignancies in Parkinson's disease? The graph I showed you where the mice lived when we got rid of this receptor, that's due to the fact they don't develop any brain disease. So there's a big piece of this to be understood as we move forward. And I would point out again that most Gaucher patients do not develop either malignancies or Parkinson's disease, so there's a lot to learn there. But this fits then into the idea we are probably beyond the single drug treatment for Gaucher disease. In the beginning, it was give the drug 
enzyme therapy, things got better, that's all you needed to do. Well, it's not all you need to do. And there are many patients who may need more than that, whether it's a combination of enzyme with some of the substrate reduction therapies, or potentially, as this story develops with the blockade of the complement system, a potential other approach here. How this exactly will fit in, I don't know, but this is a story that has now been taken up by a number of people. I know Dr. Mystery is working on part of this. How does this relate to the degree of disease you have? How does it relate to, the, how does it respond to therapy? How is it related to any particular manifestation in this disease? So this is a brand new aspect of Gaucher disease, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Grabowski. What we're planning on doing today is taking questions at the end during a panel Q&A. So I'm sure that there are going to be questions for Dr. Grabowski as well as each of our other presenters this afternoon. And I ask you to try to hold them for when we get to our Q&A. At this point, um, we're going to clear our appetizers and begin to serve. The, um, the entree. <laughs> Dr. Sidransky, would you like to come up for a minute? Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sidransky had um, approached me a short time ago. She has a, a little announcement that she would like to make. Dr. Ellen Sidransky is on our medical advisory board and um, she's affiliated with the NIH. Welcome, it's great to see everybody here and I don't really wanna take up much time. The one thing I wanted to bring up was, um, I work at the N National Institutes of Health, the NIH, and I know that a lot of you over the last decades saw Dr. Brady, Dr. Berenger, other people at the NIH. Um, at the moment, I'm responsible for evaluating patients with Gaucher disease, and somehow I inherited a lot of the um, samples that the Brady Group um, collected over the years. I'm a little bit hesitant to use those samples, even though at the time they were pa patients provided consent to use the samples, but the tools that we have today are really different from the ones that people knew about when they were donating the samples, especially when it regard, with regard to genetics and the big amount of information that we get when we do genetic studies. So I just wanted to ask if any of you were seen at the NIH, if any of you had skin biopsies taken, and you probably, if you do, you still have the scar, if you might be willing to contact, recontact us to discuss whether you'd be willing to have us continue to use your samples in the future. And again, if any of you would like to come back to the NIH and be seen, we'd also be happy to evaluate you. And thank you for participating in ongoing research and for all you do for the Gaucher community. Thanks.
We're good. Excellent. Um, is the panel, are we going to have like a panel discussion about all this? Yeah, at the end. At around 2.15, Dr. Ms. Priest, who is the second gentleman, yes, then, yes. will um, moderate a Q&A for the rest of the panel. That's up here. Great. Okay, because well, I'm going to keep their lights off That's fine. until they're really... Totally fine. Okay. Um, and that, that way, also, um, we'll be able to... Um, I'm going to sit on the end because I'm going to see if there are questions that are coming in from the live stream so that I'll yeah. be able to. I'll have to ask, ask you about that. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good, good, good. okay, wonderful. Uh, I have a backup mic uh, here um, just in case. Okay. I'm just saying. Okay. You know. Hopefully this is fine. Know, so are we good with this? They started a really good conversation back and forth. Okay. And, and one wants to dominate or take over or okay. whatever. Feel free to. Okay. Just so we can get a good feed. Great. Line. Yeah. Great, great. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're enjoying your meal. We're certainly enjoying having you here. So one of the things that we have done today, for those of you who were able to join us in person, we had a, um, a computerized drawing of the names for people who are here. Um, because we have some prizes. Um, and when I call your name, just know that before you leave today, please see Sarah Sickerman, who is on our marketing team, and she's been outside at our registration table all day, um, and you'll be able to collect your prize. Okay, so Howard, Howard Adelson, congratulations. You've got a pair of Bose Sports headphones. Bob Krupskus, where's Bob? I think I saw him. You got an Amazon gift card, okay? Okay, Valerie Mario Stein, I hope I pronounce, if I'm mispronouncing your names, please forgive me. Um, so Valerie, are you still here? Okay, well please see Sarah because you have won an iPad. Okay, uh, Ginger Nathanson. Ginger, you also have won an iPad. Congratulations. Okay. Howie Nayberg, also an iPad. Okay. Suzanne Posner, you've won a Fitbit. Okay. Because we're all about living a better today. Okay. Um, Rebecca Weisberg has also won a pair of Bose headphones. Annette Brindell. Annette, I think I, hi. You also have won a Amazon gift card, so please see Sarah before you leave today. Um, Teresa Cottons, Teresa, you won a Fitbit. And one more, Asa Abelovich. Asa, are you still here? He's here somewhere, I think. Also a pair of headphones, so please do see Sarah before you leave today, and thank you so much. Okay, so one more, one more quick announcement before I introduce two of our other wonderful speakers today. Um, Lindsay Zuckerman, can I ask you to stand, sweetie? Hi. Okay, so Lindsay and um, one of your girlfriends, Alyssa, or is Alyssa the mom? Ab Allie, I'm so sorry. Lindsay and Allie um, are two very fine young women who happen to have Gaucher and are committed to raising awareness about the disease. In fact, Lindsay took on a magnificent endeavor um, in January of 2016 um, in preparation before her bat mitzvah to do such a thing. And she, with the help of her mom, um, created an incredible dance-a-thon that was incredibly well attended and supported, and they raised over $16,000 for the National Gaucher Foundation. So this year, Lindsay and Allie looked at each other, and they wanted to do something during Gaucher Awareness Week, 
uh, month. So tomorrow, there are flyers out on one of the tables. Tomorrow, they have coordinated with a local restaurant in the New Jersey area, um, California Pizzeria, that anyone that is interested in going in and having a meal tomorrow and takes in one of those flyers, the restaurant will donate back a percentage of uh, the meal back to the National Gaucher Foundation. So it's a way for them to raise awareness and to raise funds for the foundation. And I thank you so much, Lindsay and Allie, who's not here, but her mom, Alyssa, is here today. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to introduce two of our next speakers, um, and then I'm going to allow them to do their presentations back to back without interruption, okay? Uh, one of our next presenters is Dr. Heather Lau. She's a board certified neurologist with special qualifications in, in child neurology. She has subsequent fellowship training in neurogenetics. Her practice focuses on diagnosis and management of adult and pediatric patients with suspected genetic inherited neurodegenerative diseases with an emphasis on lysosomal storage disorders, leukodystrophies, and genetic epilepsy syndromes. She also serves as a principal investigator on multiple clinical trials, evaluating the safety and efficacy of therapies for a variety of rare neurogenetic disorders. Dr. Amy Yang will then present afterwards. Dr. Amy Yang is the Associate Director for Lysosomal Storage Diseases Program and a clinical geneticist and assistant professor in the Department of Genetics and Genomic Sciences at the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She received her medical doctorate from NYU School of Medicine in 2006. She completed her pediatrics and medical genetics training at Mount Sinai and is board certified in both. At, si at Mount Sinai, she directs the medical care of children with Gaucher disease, as well as adults and children with other lysosomal storage disorders, such as Fabre, Pompeii, MPS, and Batten disease. So please give your attention to Dr. Lau and then to Dr. Amy Yang. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here today to the NGF and to Amy. Uh, several months ago, Amy approached me to ask me to speak on a topic, and I gave some thought to it. And I decided, knowing that actually Dr. Grabowski's topics and uh, but it, it, this topic stemmed from what I see in my clinic every day, um, week by week. I am the director of the lysosomal program at NYU, and with a very large uh, proportion with Gaucher type 1. And so when I sit with my patients, the, the questions that come up kind of direct how I do my uh, research and my education. So without... Oh, sorry. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about management of Gaucher um, across the lifespan with a focus on women. However, it will be relevant to all of you in the room. So I'll spend a little bit of time on pediatrics and then talk about some adult-related issues. Here are my disclosures. As, I sta uh, as was stated in my, um, my intro, I do research, and a lot of the contracted research is with pharmaceutical companies who are developing novel approaches to treating lysosomal storage disorders for Febre, Pompe, and Gaucher, as well as other ones to be determined in the future. I also serve on the advisory boards for certain um, other diseases, including uh, the Tay-Sachs and Allied diseases, as well as adult polyglucosin, another Jewish genetic disease. So today, just briefly, because we're going to go back to basics, we had some wonderful um, illustrations and, uh, of, of the pathophysiology of the, of the disorder, but we'll just summarize that briefly and go a little bit into the treatment options. What I want to focus on is the treatment or the management of the whole person and not just the disease. And we're going to look at it from uh, age, looking a little bit in childhood. 
here and then go into on bone health and women. And then we're going to end with um, a focus on pregnancy because that's been on the minds of my patients as I guide them through their pregnancy. Some of them are on their sixth pregnancy and others are on their first pregnancy. And it's a wonderful time for them, but it's also scary to have a rare disease. And so we work very closely with their OBGYN to educate their care team to make sure they get the best care throughout their pregnancy. So as we know that Gaucher is an autosomal recessive disorder with a 25% chance of being affected if your parents are carriers. It's due to a uh, the gene, GBA, um, encodes a protein that is an enzyme, a lysosomal enzyme, that breaks down glucose cerebroside into two its components. When you're deficient, it accumulates throughout the body, causing um, the transformation of macrophages into Gaucher cells. It's pan-ethnic, but there is a high prevalence in the Ashkenazi uh, Jewish population, specifically the N370S allele. And the symptoms of GD1 is heterogeneous, as we see, um, not only in age of onset, but also with severity and disease burden over time. So again, just a summary slide of how um, Gaucher affects the entire body. And we can look at here, it, it affects the liver and the spleen, enlarging those organs. And then it leads to bone marrow failure, uh, where you have possible development of anemia or low platelets. Low platelets leads to a risk of bleeding and other complications. The spleen does enlarge, and then it has a vicious cycle where it traps further platelets and lowering the platelets even more. And then the bone complications, which can occur either altogether or independently. There are people that have visceral and hematologic abnormalities with relatively low bone um, involvement. And then there's the other patient that has normal platelets, no anemia, and no organomegaly, and bone or silent bone complications. There are certain aspects of the bone complications that are reversible, bone pain, but there are other end stages that are irreversible called osteonecrosis, and then of course, affecting the thickness called bone density, leading to osteoporosis and an increased risk of fracture in later life. Okay? But here are some other multi-systemic effects that are still surprising to some of my patients. When the patient comes into my office and they said, well, um, or they're new to me, because we try to go through everything in our first meeting, and they said, well, I said, do you, do you ever get uh, a little upset stomach after a fatty meal? Do you ever have a gallbladder attack? Yes, I do. Um, so gallstones is connected to Gaucher. Um, but in the pretreatment state, there is a hypermetabolic state and in a small percent of patients, and we're seeing this decrease over time, and we think it's related to the spleen, um, but there are still some uh, patients that develop pulmonary infiltration or pulmonary hypertension. Rare, but it still happens, and we screen for it. As we all know, there, there's the hot topic of increased risk of Parkinson's disease. We're not going to focus that on today. We've done that in the past. But there's this increased risk of multiple myeloma that's on the radar of every Gaucher expert, and we screen for it after age 50. It's higher, much higher than the general population looking at different studies. But again, like Dr. Grabowski said, overall, most people don't develop either Parkinson's or multiple myeloma. But if you've developed it, it's affecting you, and we need to understand that connection better. And there's also an increased risk, as we're seeing, of immunologic abnormalities. In the front lines, as we're seeing our patients, we're seeing autoimmune disease. I'm seeing autoimmune diseases. I'm seeing autoimmune ITP. I'm seeing monoclonal gammopathy. I'm seeing all of this. And now we're going back to the lab and understanding it better. Okay. All right. So medicine these days, personalized medicine is a, is a hot topic, but it really is relevant to Gaucher, Gaucher disease because of the heterogeneous nature. Even within families, your disease burden is different than your sibling or your parent. So you have to work with your Gaucher provider to clearly define the disease burden, where it affects you, and then together, your goals of treatment, which differ based on age, sex, comorbid conditions. Are you diabetic? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have autoimmune conditions? And then looking at the disease burden, defining it in the baseline or um, in your initial meeting with your doctor, the hematologic manifestations. Not everybody has anemia. That is not a problem for many of my patients. But the low platelets puts them at risk of bleeding or for post-surgical bleeding, prolonged um, bleeding after the fact. Bone may or may not correlate with other symptoms. 
Um, again, as I said before, some of my patients don't have visceral symptoms or hematologic, but they do have bone. And then in the pediatric population, the question of growth delay and pubertal delay, and whether that is corrected or ameliorated by enzyme, we'll talk about it a little bit. So for women specifically, Gaucher can affect menarche. It has a significant role in pregnancy and in menopause and bone health, okay? So what are our general treatment goals for our patients? Of course, when you're initially coming in and starting on therapy, I had several patients come in in the past month who have never been on treatment. And we have to sit there and, and, and manage their expectations. Enzyme or substrate reduction inhibitor are very effective treatments in, in, in certain aspects. So we want to obviously correct the anemia and the platelets. And that can take as long as one to two years. And some of my patients are actually refractory to normalizing completely. But you can see changes as early as three to six months. And what's most important is the post-surgical, obstetrical, and spontaneous bleeding risks are reduced. Uh, obviously, reducing the liver and the spleen, those are organs that can uh, reduce in size. There are some limitations if you have prolonged disease leading to fibrosis or scarring of the organ. But still, you can see some dramatic response within the first year of therapy and over the next two to five years. Obviously, most of my patients are now not splenectomized. Unfortunately, one woman had a very rare complication due to mild splenomegaly post um, after childbirth leading to torsion and she lost her spleen. But that's not the, that's, that's pretty rare, both uh, described by myself and Dr. Zimran in Israel. But in general, most of our patients are able to retain their spleen now. Improve bone pain. This can take time. The bone pain, which could be re reverse, ir um, reversible without evidence of permanent damage, can still take one to two years to improve. So the, the aches and pains that are still remain after starting therapy is still burdensome. And of course, we want to prevent future damage, irreversible damage, including avascular necrosis. And finally, what's more um, on our minds are the asymptomatic aspects of bone health, bone density. We don't feel our bones. We don't feel how thick they are, um, but they are um, affected, and may, it possibly because in, pedi in the pediatric range, we're not laying down enough bone, and I'll talk to a little bit more about that later. Then obviously in adulthood, um, we start to lose bone density with age, and there are certain risk factors that increase that likelihood that you could progress from osteopenia to osteoporosis, ultimately leading to an increase in fracture. So how do we manage that with our patients with Gaucher? And obviously subjective, improving fatigue. That fatigue can be from the anemia or there's an independent, just overall fatigue related to Gaucher disease. And that I do find for my patients who were um, off drug during the shortage several years ago, they, their first thing that they felt was the fatigue return before their anemia and platelets in several of my patients. So what is the treatment for Gaucher? We all know enzyme replacement therapy, with the first being back in 1991. And I'll go through briefly in the other three, the three current enzyme therapies. And it is possible to reverse many of the signs and symptoms of the disease, but it's not completely correcting everything, as we saw earlier. And now, there was one substrate reduction inhibitor that's been around for several years, but the new one that's out called Serdelga, um, works in the same way. We're basically reducing the accumulation of GC in the cells and then letting your own enzyme clear out the cells. And the pivotal trials do really show quite an effective response, even if you've never been on enzyme before, to be able to normalize your anemia, your platelets, and your liver and spleen, and even your bone. Okay. So here we go, just in a brief summary slide that you can take a moment to look at. My patients always ask me, what are the differences in the enzymes? Um, I'm, so I do go into detail with my patients about the three current available enzyme therapies. I get lots of questions, which one's better, which one works better, and I sit there and I go through the data with all of them. They're all proven to be effective at reversing many of the symptoms. They are made slightly different, but at the end of the day, the choice is discussed between me and the patient and their particular questions and concerns. So we have imaglucerase, serazyme, velaglucerase, vipriv, 
and telegluserase, a little bit newer, uh, Elalisa, which is marketed by Pfizer. So three different companies, three different enzymes, and a whole lot of literature out there to go through with my patients. Now, enzyme replacement therapy requires intravenous infusions every two weeks, a range of doses you can talk about with your provider, uh, depending on your um, particular disease severity. And then there's the substrate reduction inhibitor. Meglistat is the oldest. It's also known as Zavesca. It's been around since 2003. It's a second line if you fail the other ERTs. It does not have first line indication. And then Elaglustat or Serdelga recent approvals by Genzyme and Sanofi, and that's a first line. For patients naive to treatment, they can start on Serdelga. There are all risks and uh, side effect profiles related to each of these um, therapies, and I would implore you to talk to your provider about what works best for you. Obviously, this is oral, and this is intravenous, but there are other reasons why you might choose one over the other. That's not that finished. I have about 40 other slides. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if someone can help me. I have it on my phone if I need to forward it somewhere. I have it memorized, I can do that. <laughs> Probably be easier for me too. If we get a logo for a moment, Gary. Okay. So the next part of the talk was going to talk about impact of Gaucher disease on pediatric patients and then a little bit of a focus on girls in particular. So there is a question of um, when you present in childhood, we do see short stature in some of our patients suggesting that there is some kind of growth problem or delay. Uh, when I've sent my patients for evaluation just to ensure that there's no other um, factor going on, it comes back to that it's probably the Gaucher. So when we look at a child who has short stature, we look at their parents and we want to calculate their mid-parental height and then see where they fall on the curve. So even if your, patient, if your child is fifth percentile, if your parents are fifth percentile, it's not so much of a discordant there. And we think that's their genetic potential. But if your parents are five foot eight and six foot four and your child's fifth percentile, you wonder then, is there something impacting that? And Gaucher disease has been reported in many studies to show that there is some growth delay. In some series, especially one in Israel by Dr. Zimron showed that some percent, up to 40%, eventually normalize their growth even without treatment. But then there's another cohort of, of children with Gaucher that don't normalize their, uh, their height. And so that's a question about indicating for treatment possibly. So the growth delay goes hand in hand with pubertal delay. And so for females that are not treated, during puberty you can see some delay in, 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 in menarche, which is also known as menses onset of um, your menstrual cycle. So with enzyme replacement therapy, there are certain studies that have showed normalization of growth and puberty. But in addition to having untreated Gaucher um, children, during menses you could have menorrhagia, which is prolonged bleeding, as well as uh, the delay in the menarche. So that's another, it's not a sole indication for treatment, but we have seen in a, a series in Israel where there was a significant proportion of, of bleeding. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, so I did send it, didn't I? Okay. So, so the treatment guidelines in, um, for children reflect the adults. We want to correct anemia, correct platelets. We want to reduce the liver and spleen down to sizes that are not dangerous, and as well as um, make sure that we uh, correct any growth delay. Okay. So I quoted here, from one of the studies by Dr. Kaplan back in 2013, ERT has reduced the incidence of severe and irreversible initial complications in pediatric patients. And this has permitted better development of these patients. 
So the silent disease, the bone disease, that's what we want to prevent. So there's two forms that I worry about, um, development of avascular necrosis, which is irreversible bone damage, because that weakens the bone and sets up a child later in life for possible issues with needing joint replacements and such, but also bone density. So, so from pre-adolescence to the end of the second de decade, bone size and bone mass increase rapidly. Uh, the greatest deposition of bone mineral occurs between age 8 and age 18, most depositing during puberty. So this is normal bone development in a child that does not have Gaucher disease. The bone width increases before the mineral content, and it increases before the bone density. This occurs much earlier in girls, 12 months before uh, menarche, and up to 12 months after. So that's where that greatest um, change in bone mass and size occurs. And as it's occurring, there is actually a little dip in density, and there's an increased risk of distal radius fracture in children at that time point. This is in non-Gaucher children. Peak bone mass is achieved by age 30. So I have a little graph here to show that. But again, <laughs> bone mass is, so bone is a dynamic organ, just like your liver and spleen. It's just much slower to change over time. Bone remodeling is a balance between two different types of cells in a very basic sense, the builders and the and the destruction, so the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. And that is what happens in adolescence. That is a critical time period to build bone that then, after age 30, is gonna slowly decrease. Okay. So in a study, actually uh, the paper was led by Dr. Mystery, um, the impact of Gaucher disease in children. In pre-treated children, low, low bone density was prevalent in all age groups. If you um, stratify, 44% of children demonstrated some sort of reduced bone density when compared to other children. 76% of adolescents had reduced bone density, 54% of young adults, and 52% of older adults. And this is obviously with the adolescents probably related to the other <laughs> growth spurt and the pubertal delay that we're seeing. And so that is a critical time period to intervene if you need to do so. So how do we optimize bone health in children and adolescents? So what we worry about is making sure that before, regardless, regardless of treatment or of with enzyme or not, we need to have adequate calcium intake and vitamin D. Those are the building bones of bone. Um, so my, my patients ask me how much and what should I be taking, and we can talk about it after, but in general, 50% um, of the total body calcium is laid down in, puber in, in puberty for girls. So you want to make sure your children are getting good calcium um, intake. Calcium is interesting. You can't take all of it in one sitting is how we, uh, when I talk about it in my clinic. You have to divide it throughout the day. And the best source is actually from your food. So calcium from yogurt, dairy um, is, is, is better than taking the supplements. Um, the vitamin D, vitamin D is a little bit more difficult to get from dietary sources, and we certainly don't recommend to go out into the sun anymore, but vitamin D can be, um, you can ha get it from salmon, you can get it from other, um, from fortified foods. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but it's important to make sure it's adequately um, supplemented. And there are actual drops that you can take, vitamin D3, to um, increase the levels. The total levels for children between age 9 and 18 are 1,300 milligrams per day. The other aspect is making sure your children are active. Exercise is probably the most important uh, component of building bone in adolescence. In a prospective study back in um, the 90s, it followed 264 patients, not with Gaucher disease, aged 9 to 18, and they found that over those 11 years, those with the best bone were the ones that had maintenance of normal weight, exercise, and non-smoking. They remained uh, without smoking. So those are easier ways. Um, and then the question is, what about ERT? 
Well, ERT in many studies have shown some kind of correction of this growth delay. And we do have a graph, again, from the paper in 2011 by Dr. Mystery showing that there is an increase in bone density uh, from one range to another. Sorry. However, it does highlight that peak window of uh, opportunity to intervene is before or right before puberty because that's where you're going to start laying down the most bone. So what about bone health in adults and females specifically? As I said, bone is remodeling all the time, even in adulthood, um, both forming and resorbing. The peak bone mass that's attained by 30 um, starts to decline, and it more rapidly declines in women after menopause. And that's because the two most um, important factors for the development of osteoporosis is being a female uh, and age and loss of estrogen. A clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis, I'm sure most of you are undergoing some kind of surveillance with DEXA scans, and your doctor is looking at your T-scores and making sure that they stay within normal or at least stabilized. So reduced bone density comes in either osteopenia, which is a minus 1 to minus 2.5, then osteoporosis is more severe. And what's the difference? The risk of fracture is substantially larger when you hit the osteoporotic range, and that's a T-score of more than 2.5, negative 2.5. The best way to do surveillance is through uh, DEXA scans, and the timing of that is very important. It's hard in some of our patients to justify. So most um, women um, without Gaucher disease start to do that postmenopausal surveillance. However, we need to look earlier. And over the past 10 years, we see that we're doing it now in adolescents and even in children, and we're developing standards to compare uh, um, the bone density. So if we look at the Gaucher disease uh, population specifically, the estimated risk of osteoporosis without treatment uh, in one study showed anywhere from 10 to 30 percent in women and 10 to 25 percent in men. So again, the Gaucher, the, la the enzyme deficiency state leads to a worse um, uh, or increased risk of developing osteoporosis. So how do we manage uh, bone density in adults with Gaucher disease? Again, it's calcium, vitamin D, and exercise. The calcium requirements are slightly different uh, depending on your age. Um, total 1,000 in premenopausal women and then 1,200 in postmenopausal women. We want to avoid overdose, and we still need to divide those doses into two to three servings or supplements throughout the day. Vitamin D, again, the source from the sun is not the best for us, but we can get it from our diet and fortified foods or simple supplement. You can follow the levels, and that's what I do with my patients, so not one, one type of um, dose is correct. Uh, typically, I'll take a, a, do a level, and then we'll try either 800 or 1,000 units a day, and then go from there and see if we can get that target level between 40 and 60. I work hand-in-hand hand with our rheumatologists and endocrinologists because in the osteopenic range or the mildly low bone density range, what we're doing now is just modifying our lifestyle factors. So also encouraging weight-bearing exercise. A common question I get is what is weight-bearing exercise? So walking is a great exercise. Running is a bit... Uh, it has a bit of an impact on the joints and may not be for everyone. But things like swimming, although good for your cardiovascular health, is not as weight-bearing. And then weight resistance training. Anything that tugs on the bone is going to build the bone and stimulate remodeling. Um, diet, there's no clear evidence to have a high-protein or low-protein diet. Um, so that's not really uh, a tactic, just getting the fortified foods that you need. Um, and then smoking cessation. Uh, the best thing you could do for your health is what I tell my patients. Yes, we're correcting your enzyme, but you're still smoking. And I actually have that in quite a few patients. Um, <laughs> and that is probably the number one thing you can do to, to uh, help your, um, to give you a better outcome. And obviously avoid excess uh, alcohol and caffeine because that can also affect your bone density. I had some examples of food for both uh, vitamin D and calcium because that's asked a lot in my clinic. So what about Gaucher-specific therapy? Um, for children, uh, I did show in a, a couple of slides that there was improvement. And there is data now showing that bone, although it takes longer, 
can respond to uh, enzyme therapy over time. And then also the SRT, new uh, abstracts are coming out from the long-term data from Sir Delga showing an improvement in bone density. Um, I have a poster, an oral presentation later this month to show that the eight years on, on Elaglustat showed that there was improvement um, from osteopenia to the normal range in the lumbar spine. And Dr. Mystery is also presenting long-term results of Elaglustat of a separate study, again, showing improvement just on four and a half years in the spine T-score. So it is affecting bone, and that's wonderful news. So management of osteoporosis. So if you migrated now from osteopenia to osteoporosis, that's when I bring in my rheumatologist and endocrinologist. This is a multisystemic disease that requires a multidisciplinary approach at all phases of your life. So here I send them off to the rheumatologist and endocrinologist because they know their therapies. And we're gonna start looking at different classes of therapies. Now we don't have one good study to say, this is the type of drug we should use in Gaucher disease-related osteoporosis. That should be done, and that would be a good study to do. We have the bisphosphonates that I'm sure most of you are aware of. Fosamax is one of them, Actinel, Boniva, those are the brand names. There's different approaches. So the bisphosphonates help um, to reduce bone resorption. But then there's parathyroid hormone derivatives that um, mimic the uh, endogenous hormone to promote uh, bone formation and remodeling. It's a daily injection for a short period of time for about 24 months. And then there's prolia, which is actually an antibody that um, attacks one of these rank ligand uh, molecules to improve the formation. Now, each of these diseases, I'm not, uh, each of these um, therapies, I'm not gonna go into what is better than the other because it really depends on the individual before me. It depends if you have esophageal issues and you can't tolerate the reflux. It depends on risk of cancer. There is a black box warning on one of them. But it has been reported to be used in uh, patients with Gaucher disease. So we don't know which one is best, and you should sit down with your endocrinologist and go through it. And your endocrinologist should call your Gaucher doctor. We used to have patients sit on Fosamax uh, or one of the bisphosphonates for years, and there's an increased risk of jaw necrosis. There are risk factors. So you have to weigh the risk versus the benefit of being on therapy and of what type of therapy. Because what we're trying to ultimately reduce is the risk of hip fracture or silent pathologic fractures of the spine that can cause significant pain and decreased quality of life in your 50s, 60s, 70s, on top of any other joint problems that you might have. I have a... I have a, one patient of mine, she is dear to me, she sees me every three months, um, more for social support, I think. <laughs> she is absolutely afraid of taking any of these therapies, and I've slowly increased her um, enzyme therapy up to a, a more therapeutic dose for her. And despite not taking her vitamin D and not taking any of these other potential antiosteoporotic therapies, she's increased her bone by 20%. So that'll be reported on next year. I don't advise that, but that's very interesting that her enzyme alone helped to, to build her bone. That's an N of one, and I'm gonna start looking at my other patients. But at the end of the day, it's a multimodal approach. You have to maximize your vitamin D, your calcium, and you have to look at your enzyme therapy or your SRT. All right, so the final few minutes, um, if you can allow me, I do want to focus a little bit on pregnancy. Um, this past year, I published a paper on, on pregnancy outcomes in collaboration with a registry, and, and that's because it's, it's near and dear to my heart. My patients that go through their pregnancy, it's such a, like I said before, a wonderful time, but it's also sometimes scary for them. So the typical pregnancy, the typical physiologic changes during pregnancy for any woman includes mild anemia in your second trimester, necessitating iron. You can have a transient decrease in your platelets in your third trimester, um, up to 5% of patients um, that spontaneously resolves later. You can have ligamentous laxity, uh, so you're, you're um, a little bit more double-jointed or prone to uh, some injuries, low back pain, hip pain, 
um, which can mimic or get confused with Gaucher pain. Uh, in the postpartum, up to six to eight weeks, it takes to reverse some of these changes. So now you add in Gaucher disease. So pregnancy definitely has the potential to exacerbate all of the Gaucher complications. When I looked back over the literature, the first reports of pregnancy in Gaucher, um, the, providing, or the prevailing opinion at the time was to advise all women to avoid pregnancy at all costs if you had Gaucher disease. This is in the 1940s and the 1950s. If a woman became pregnant, regardless of a prior successful pregnancy, the physician recommended termination. This is a shocking. This is completely written in 1940s and 50s literature. But as they reported successful outcomes of women with Gaucher uh, having successful pregnancies, the medical opinion started to change, and that was important to know. And obviously, from the 50s to the 90s, if you look at the literature, you see the complications still remain. So it was risky, but it was done. What were the risks? Worsening anemia, worsening platelets, leading to tri um, uh, prenatal uh, bleeding, but postnatal hemorrhage, requiring transfusions. The liver and spleen could enlarge during this time. They were worried then about en en encroaching on the growth of the fetus. But in worsening bone pain, osteonecrosis could occur during pregnancy. Pregnancy is a hypermetabolic state, requires a lot more energy, and if you're untreated, it's taxing the system. When they did a survey of 102 pregnancies in 53 patients, they showed up to 37% had first trimester bleeding, a spontaneous abortion rate of 25%, third trimester bleeding of 5%, and a th up to a third had worsening of their platelets. Their skeletal sy symptoms did worsen in about 24%. Uh, postpartum courses showed significant amounts of hemorrhage. 70% of patients had some form of hemorrhage requiring transfusions in 55%, post-op fever in 44%. With the advent of enzyme therapy, that changed dramatically. And another series showed uh, in a cohort of pregnancies, about 60 pregnancies in 40 women, absolutely no complications of hemorrhage or requiring transfusions. So ERT um, has been associated with reduced risk of spontaneous abortions in, in females with Gaucher, reduced risk of GD-related complications, organomegaly was stabilized or did not worsen, bone pain, bone crises were reduced significantly, and women were able to come through the delivery um, uh, intact and with good outcomes. The fetuses were not affected. So we worry about using medications during pregnancy, and that's a question I get quite a bit from my uh, women who are thinking about having children. And if we look at the literature since the advent of ERT, we see increasing reports of good outcomes with, our, with the babies, no adverse effects on the infants. The rates of spontaneous abortion, miscarriage, or genetic anomalies are relatively the same between untreated and treated. In the paper that um, we did, we looked at, just quickly give you a sense, of 453 pregnancies and 189 patients. 117 of these pregnancies were exposed to therapy in those 68 patients, as opposed to 336 patient, uh, pregnancies in untreated. So that was pr probably before ERT. And out of those, we look at the outcomes were essentially the same. And I'm gonna be a little bit more brief, um, and you can ask me later about the specifics of it. But what we showed was that ERT, preconception, through the entire pregnancy, had good outcomes for mother and baby, and there was no suggestion of any adverse offense um, on, of the enzyme on the child. This is not a uniform blanket um, recommendation. You need to talk to your doctor. If you're not on ERT, simply becoming pregnant is not a reason to start ERT. Um, you have to sit down and look at your disease burden and the reasons why you were not on ERT beforehand. Unfortunately, recently, one of my patients who was new to me she did not want to be on therapy, and she got pregnant. Her platelets are below 70,000. She has overwhelming splenomegaly, and so we have to kind of catch up now for the rest of the pregnancy. But if beforehand your disease burden is low and you're not on ERT, simply getting pregnant does not reflexively put you on the ERT. 
But if you're on ERT or you're not on ERT and you start to have worsening of your Gaucher symptoms, then that might be an indication. So I have a couple slides to show that. So management of Gaucher disease in pregnancy pre should start preconception. Sit with your doctor. What is your health status? What is your disease burden? Should you be on therapy or not? If you're kind of borderline and you're thinking about it, you might opt for ERT beforehand because there's always risk with ERT, with hypersensitivity reactions occurring. And then while you're pregnant, to have surveillance. Uh, finally, the multidisciplinary approach applies here as well. I work with a hematologist. I work with, I work with anesthesia. I work with orthopedics if needed, as well as the OBGYN. Certain hip issues from the prior ages of avascular necrosis can, imp in, um, can impact vaginal deliveries, so that's important to consider. Most of my patients can um, withstand a, a vaginal delivery and do, do not need C-sections, but some who have had avascular necrosis of the hips needs to be seen by orthopedics to be cleared. Uh, hematolo hematology, well, why should they see a hematologist? They've been diagnosed with Gaucher already. Well, to make sure that there's no platelet um, dysfunction as on top of platelet levels, make sure there's no other coagulation or clotting problems. Somebody had asked me beforehand, you know, uh, recurrent um, abortions or recurrent terminations, are they part of Gaucher? In the pretreatment era that happened, and sometimes it was due to low platelets, and other times it was due to a comorbid clotting problem that is also prevalent in certain ethnic backgrounds. Okay? So... I'm going to summarize here. Gaucher disease is a multisystemic disorder that affects patients over their entire lifespan. And women, in particular, have specific parts of their life that are affected by Gaucher, including menarche and pregnancy and their bone health. Pediatric patients have additional issues with growth and puberty. And therefore, the, the assessment of whether to start ERT has to take into, those accounts, uh, into, into that account as well. For adult women with Gaucher, um, especially post-menopause, maintenance of bone health is important and to reduce the risk of fracture, and it may include anti-osteoporotic medications. And finally, for women uh, who are of their childbearing ages, it's important to sit down, define your disease burden, decide about therapy, and then receive some comfort from the fact that ERT has been used throughout pregnancy. And one final word, SRT has not been um, looked at in pregnancy. And I did have a slide on showing that substrate reduction inhibitors, Serdelga and the others, they are small molecules and potentially could cross the placenta. So I would uh, caution against the use of SRTs in pregnancy. Thank you. That deserves an extra round of applause. <laughs> While Dr. Lau was presenting, they have been working on the, uh, the tech component here. Are we good for Dr. Yang's presentation? Sure. We're good, okay. Dr. Lau, thank you so very much for all that winging. And uh, this goes to show that uh, technology has its ups and downs. So thank you. All right, thanks for bearing, have, uh, for your patience. Um, okay, so um, my talk today is gonna be about pre-symptomatic um, children that we've been following at Mount Sinai. Um, we, uh, I started this whole thing in 2012 um, under Manisha Bawani's guidance at Mount Sinai. Um, so it's only been a few years, but it's a great learning few years. Um, and I think one of the most amazing thing is um, just the wonderful team that we have, but also at Mount Sinai, um, there's a very interesting uh, phenomenon where we take care of patients with Gaucher, but we also do 
um, carrier screening up at the lab. And I think through many efforts within the community, including uh, National Gaucher Foundation and other um, Jewish genetic screening programs, uh, we've been able to, over the years, pick up carrier couples. And then, um, and then I've been fortunate enough to um, see some of these carrier couples um, prenatally during um, the fact that they were uh, diagnosed as couples, they wanted to know more about Gaucher disease and how that would affect their child. And then so we've been able to follow these children very early on, and I think, um, so I'll be presenting some of that data today. Uh, sorry. I, I don't think this is working. Yeah. He's gonna make my controller work. Wonderful, okay, great. So um, first, very quickly, I'm just going to review what clinical guidance we do have out in the literature about following children with type one Gaucher disease very quickly. Um, and then I want to address um, the questions that we um, hear over and over again with um, families and carrier couples that pose these questions to us. And this is really these frequently asked questions were the reason for um, the study I'm a, and the, the data that I'm about to present. Um, so I will present that data from our, the children that we've been able to follow at Mount Sinai. Okay, and in particular of no, I just want to say that, um, and I'll show you the breakdown of these children and their genotypes, but the majority of signs and symptoms I'll be describing is mainly from uh, patients who have genotype N370S homozygous. So that's very important to remember that this is a very particular uh, genotype or group of patients with this genotype. And I wouldn't be able to give you any data um, on the genotypes are uh, N370S with other uh, mutations are more severe. Um, we just don't have that data, unfortunately. Okay. So this is um, written in 2013, about the time when I started with the lysosomal storage disease program, so I was very happy to have that. Um, and it was led by a group of pediatric um, Gaucher disease experts, including Dr. Kaplan. Um, so basically, the recommendation um, for symptomatic children, so these are children who present with their Gaucher disease to the, the doctor, and so, of course, they're going to be started on enzyme replacement because some of you may know from the community and the experiences, these children could have um, quite a number of disease uh, symptoms, including large spleen, low platelets, anemia, and all the things that um, Dr. Lau had talked about. So, of course, they're going to be on enzyme replacement. So, while these children are on enzyme replacement, the recommendation um, is as Dr. Lau had presented, every six to 12 months, um, they'll be followed for non-skeletal assessments, and that includes a physical exam, including a good neurological exam, um, and following the growth of these patients. The liver and the spleen needs to be measured, um, preferably uh, through an MRI, as, as recommended by the Kaplan and, and the group. Um, and CBC is measured routinely, and only if there are concerns for bleeding or if they're going um, for a procedure, we want to measure the coagulation, which is called PT-PTT. Um, and of course, um, you guys are well aware of these Gaucher disease markers that we also follow in clinic, uh, Kokaito for short for chitotriosidase, uh, TRAP, and ACE. Um, and then skeletal assessment is done uh, as recommended every one to two years with a bone density scan and then also imaging, preferably um, through an MRI. And so we'd be looking at the femur and the spine. Okay. Um, so what about pre-symptomatic children? So when this group was ri um, writing this paper, um, of course, they're, they're well aware of um, children in the family, 
Um, and then, you know, they got their genetic testing, but they didn't come with symptoms. So this is what the, the this group of people that they were uh, referring to. So for pre-symptomatic children with no symptoms of Gaucher disease yet, um, they had recommending the same thing, but just not so frequently. So the non-skeletal assessments is every year um, with, the, with what you see previously. And then the skeletal assessments were a little bit um, uh, less frequent every two years. And so this, this guideline I've been following at our, our, in our clinic. Um, the other thing that um, Dr. Kalish and Dr. Kaplan were able to publish was um, a specific severity disease score for children. So the, in a, the, the um, people in the room who are adults, we, have, uh, we know that there is an adult severity score for people with Gaucher, but this is specifically for children. Um, and I, I do use this in my clinic, and it has been quite helpful for me. Because when I first started, um, I also had to learn as a clinician um, on, you know, what are the signs and symptoms that um, do present, um, if I'm missing anything. And then overall, you know, we, we all know that we don't treat one specific f uh, part of their um, sign or symptom. So if a child just has a low platelet, um, we don't treat just that number. Or if a child has um, a really high chiral triacidase, we don't just treat that number, right? We have to look at the overall picture of what the child is presenting. And so this, I thought, was a really nice score that kind of put all these things together. Um, so as you can see, um, maybe not so much in the back of the room, so I'll describe a little bit. It's broken down into four main domains. So there's the bone disease domain, the hematological domain, the visceral domain, and the growth do domain. And, um, and so um, for the bone, it's really sort of, um, are there, have there been fractures? Have there been lytic lesions seen on x-rays? Have there been recurrent uh, or chronic bone complaints of joint pains and, and things like that? And also uh, bone density is here. So in children, we do bone density and it's based on Z score, not T score. And then so we could, but we also use the same modality. It's a bone density scan and we calculate the Z score. And the, um, so this is part of um, um, the calculations of the bone score here. And then hematologic is just that, that information you get from the CBC. You could see if the child's anemic or not. You could see uh, if the child's platelet is low or not. And that also plots here. Um, there's also this um, place where we ask um, the family if they've noticed that the child is bleeding or, um, for example, easy bleeding or bruising. Um, visceral, um, we measure the liver and spleen, as we say, on imaging. And growth, um, we measure, it's just a height. We just measure a height as, you, as soon as you come into the clinic, we do that. And then we, um, in the beginning, of, if it's the first time that we saw you, we'll ask for parental heights. And then so this way we can calculate, you know, what is the mid-parental height expectancy for the child and then whether that child is meeting that expectancy. Um, so we plot the child on the percentile. We compare that, um, that child's height to the mid-parental high expectation. And then we also, see, um, as we follow the child, we see whether there is a change in the height percentage, whether there is a decrease or not. Um, so all this is put together and, and nicely on the summarized score at the end. Um, and for um, Kalish and Kaplan, they said for mild disease, it's a score of less than six. For moderate, it's a score of six to nine, and for severe, it's a score of over nine with a maximum score of 20.4. Um, so we do do this in our clinic. Okay, um, so um, I know you guys are aware, and I know National Gaucher Foundation has been great at raising awareness about um, the carrier frequency. So we all know that N370S is the most common allele in uh, in people with Gaucher disease, um, type one. Um, that's 71.8% of the Jewish um, patients and then 43.6% of the non-Jewish patients um, will harbor at least one uh, copy of N370S. 
Um, and then you can see the breakdown of the genotype itself that 29% of all patients in the um, registry, this is from the registry data, 29% um, of individuals with Gaucher disease are homozygous. Um, and so the reason um, why I'm bringing this up is because we, we know from the previous talks um, that um, this is a very mild genotype when you're homozygous for N370S. And in fact, the mean age we know at diagnosis is 28 years uh, for people who are homozygous for N370S. And actually, it's a wide spectrum, right? Not very many people um, will present at 28. In fact, they may present uh, later. Um, and some actually do not receive a diagnosis until in their eighth or ninth decade. Uh, but we also know, on the other hand, the other end of the spectrum, there are, of course, children with, um, who are homozygous for N370S who will present with symptoms. So the problem with um, the, the genotype is just not enough information for us to predict who's going to develop disease in childhood and who's going to remain healthy into adulthood. Um, and, and I know um, researchers are working on that, and that's a burning question for all of us. So in light of this information, then, when we counsel carrier couples, of course, these are the kind of questions that's going to come up, right? You know, what kind of monitoring is needed and how often? And when will they develop symptoms? And so we want to try and see um, if we have information on that, how many children will require treatment um, in childhood? And when should we start treatment? You know, what are some of the, the decision-making process here? Um, so, so really it's because of your questions to us that we went then back into our charts. So uh, this is a retrospective. Um, so retrospective means that we're, we didn't collect the data as we go. This is all data that was already in the chart um, that was collected just through routine follow-up. And so we really wanted to answer the question for this specific group of um, people, um, the carrier couples who are asking these questions. So um, we um, looked in the chart and found children who were identified or diagnosed only because their parents were, were carriers. And, and, then, um, and then because of that, these children were then diagnosed. And um, so we were able to find 38 pre-symptomatic children um, in, our, in our chart review, um, ages 1 to 18. And they were followed from 1998 to 2016. And of course, um, they were followed yearly at our center, and these are the, the information that we were able to get consistently within the chart. Um, the CBC Kaido, we also do a, a vitamin D because it's vital to bone health. Um, PT, PTT um, was only done for the older children because they're really, um, as you can see, there wasn't very much report of bleeding. And so sometimes it was done, sometimes it wasn't done, uh, mainly because of phlebotomy issues where um, difficulty was drawing blood. So we tend to save it for the older children because it's easier to draw blood on older children. Um, we actually um, be, um, don't do MRIs. Um, we actually implemented abdominal ultrasound um, starting at age four to five. Um, the problem with the MRI Again, so we're very cognizant that majority of children um, are, um, with N370S homozygous uh, genotype are going to be mild. Um, and then so you're trying to weigh the risks and benefits of MRI and having to undergo anesthesia because the children can't stay still in the MRI for too long. Um, so that's why we resorted to an abdominal ultrasound. It's not ideal, and I'll show you the reason why it's not ideal, but um, this is, I think it's a, it's a good trade-off. Um, and DEXA, we start um, doing the DEXA scan, looking at bone density starting at age five to six, and that's only because um, we only have normative data at our center for children starting at age five. So we can't really, comp if we do a DEXA scan on children under that age, we really can't make sense of their Z-scores. Um, X-rays were not ordered until, unless, um, uh, you know, the child complains of chronic bone pain or so it's impacting their day-to-day -day daily activities, um, or if there's just a very severe bone pain. 
Um, only two children um, in this cohort had received an MRI, and this is um, either the child is older now and then can able to just sit still for the MRI, or that um, we actually had concerns. Um, and then so the, the abdominal ultrasound was just not uh, um, specific enough. So this is sort of the breakdown of the information and the demographics of these children. So as you can see, um, these children, the majority of children were diagnosed prenatally. Um, so these were um, carrier couples who were identified as carrier couples and then um, they became concerned and they wanted their OBGYN provider to test the pregnancy. Um, and, but there were a couple of other um, groups of children who weren't diagnosed prenatally but came to our clinic afterwards and then we were able to you know, diagnose them that way. Um, and um, this, is the, this is the majority of the genotypes that we see. The homozygous and 370S is 84% of these children. And um, we'll talk about this compound heterozygous genotype, but 16% of our children in this cohort had N, uh, one allele with N370S and one allele of, of R496H. Um, and then this is sort of the breakdown of, of the age of um, our children at their last evaluation. So a uh, majority of our children that we're following are now in uh, school age. And we sort of have an equal breakdown to, between um, boys and girls. Okay, so just a quick word about R496 age in case some of you guys have never heard about this variant. It's a very rare variant and it's thought to confer um, risk for a mild uh, Gaucher disease type one. Um, and so far it's only been described in the Ashkenazi Jewish uh, population and not in other types of population. And actually there's you know case reports here and there. Um, so there's generally a, a lack of clinical data in patients who are what we call compound heterozygotes for N370S and R496H. So um, for those of you who do have this genotype, um, we actually have 14 patients with this um, particular genotype at Mount Sinai. Um, six are children and eight are adults. And what I can tell you is um, so far none of these children to date and their mean age right now, these six children are age seven, um, and uh, none of them had had elevated chitotriosidase so far, and so far have remained asymptomatic. And also, um, two of the, only two of the eight adults were diagnosed with Gaucher due to symptoms. Um, their mean age at diagnosis was 39, and um, they are now on enzyme replacement therapy. But um, five adults of the, out of the eight were diagnosed incidentally through prenatal carrier screening. And one adult was diagnosed after a family member had direct to consumer testing. So um, this sort of supports the idea, our numbers sort of support the idea that the N370S and R496H in combination is a very mild, very mild Gaucher disease, okay. Um, so this is some of the, we'll go through now some of the data that, I, that um, we see in these children in terms of lab work and, and studies. Um, so the hematological findings so far, I can tell you that none of the children had anemia. Um, and the majority of children have mild to normal platelets. So that's a cutoff of 120. So the laboratory will flag something abnormal or uh, low platelets at 150. But we also know there's a lot of people in the general population who could have mildly low uh, thrombocytopenia or low platelets. So this is why we kind of group mild normal together um, at this cutoff. And the majority of children um, that we saw um, do not have any major issues with their platelets. 95% fall in this group. And only two patients um, have mild thrombocytopenia, so that's between 60 and less than 120. And none has severe thrombocytopenia. Which, so hopefully that some of this data will be reassuring to you guys. Um, the liver and the spleen volume, we do multiples of norm. 
after the it's seen on ultrasound. And so again, um, for the spleen, I want uh, it's on the bottom here. Um, majority of children do not have um, uh, splenomegaly; they're mild to normal. And only a few, only three patients, so 12% of them had moderate uh, spleen volume between five to 15 multiples of norm. And none had severe um, enlargement of the spleen. I want you to see this funky number here. <laughs> so um, the liver volume here, um, there seemed to be a it didn't, uh, preponderance of children with an increased um, moderate size of liver volume, so that's between 1.25 to 2.5 mn. Um, and I think this is actually due to the fact that we're using ultrasound. Um, I think it's an overestimation because the ultrasound is not a great way to, to calculate liver volume. And in fact, the one patient that um, is now a teenager and we were able to do the MRI, the, the time that he switched from the ultrasound to the MRI, we saw a drop in the calculated MN. So I think that's probably due to the, the ultrasound and the limitations we have with ultrasound um, because this number doesn't correlate with all the numbers that you'll see, all the percents, okay? Um, okay, and then so let's look at height because we worry about height and we worry about bone, right? Um, so the height percentile though, it, I think what I see is um, is going along a general population growth curve. So um, there'll be approximately 25 per, um, uh, 30 percent people within the 25th, uh, 5 to 25th percentile, and the majority of people are above 25th percentile. So that, I think that just goes along with the growth curve of the general population. But then if we look more closely, and let's compare now these children to their expected midparental height, um, what you see, the majority of children do match their mid-parental height expectations, but seven children um, out of our cohort, or 19% of the children that we see, they, they are fallen just below what's expected for mid-parental height, well, one standard deviation is below expected. And so far, none of the children that we've seen had um, less than that, but so um, below two standard deviations before, below expected. Um, and then same thing in terms of uh, changes in height or decrease in height percentile. Majority of children maintain their height percentile at that growth curve. Um, and only two children that we had um, followed had a decline in their height percentile. Um, so again, um, most children don't have issues with growth. Um, the major thing we have to do is just comparing them to mid-parental high expectations, and that's really what we see here um, as a significant value. And then bone mineral density, we talk about z-scores in children. Um, so less than two, uh, so negative, less than negative two means osteoporosis in children. Between negative one to negative two, that, um, that's a place where we said osteopenia, and above negative one, we say this is normal. Um, so we have only two children in our cohort with osteopenia, and the majority of children had normal bone density, and none had severe osteoporosis. Um, okay, so, um, this is a slide um, in looking at Kaido, because you guys ask me about Kaido a lot. I was like, well, what does this mean? So Kaido, um, just to um, remind some of you, or for those who you don't know, um, Kaido triosidase is an enzyme that is, lives in the macrophages. And then when the macrophages are stimulated and, and they're stressed out, they then release the Kaido triosidase. The Kaido triosidase doesn't do anything for us physiologically. And so it's just, a, it's just the marker that we see. So, um, um, but it is a good measure or a marker or reflection of you know, how stressed is that macrophage. And so, um, so while it's a, it's a marker for Gaucher disease, it can fluctuate also day to day and visit to visit um, because it also depends on just what the macrophage is encountering at that visit. Um, so, um, so you can see this wild fluctuation of, of chitotriosidase in our group of patients. 
Um, but we can um, sort of make some sense of the trend. Um, so each of these uh, round dots is a patient and their chirotriosidase level at a particular visit. Um, so um, these are the ages at the visit, and this is their chirotriosidase. Um, first, what you, I want you guys to know is it's very minimally elevated, if at all, in the neonatal period. So we don't expect to see a large chirotriosidase level as soon as you're born. Um, but it does sort of trend over time. As you know, if you look at the, the spread of the dots, we do see a trend of increase that as we grow, as um, I would imagine as the lysosome storage is getting larger and larger and the macrophages are getting a little more stressed out. And so we also expect, and we do see sort of increase in Cairo as we age, okay? Um, and so I, what I wanted to do in this graph was to separate um, the children that we had not yet recommended to start enzyme replacement and the children actually that we had uh, recommended to start enzyme replacement. And those children were only four of them, so 11% of our cohort. Um, so in the red line, you'll see sort of the trend of the children, the four children that were recommended to start enzyme replacement at this time, um, at the last visit, I'm sorry. And then the children who so far are not recommended to start enzyme replacement. And you could see actually there is a difference in the slope of the curve, right? You could see a difference in their trends. Um, also, um, we had talked about how I like to use the Gelsche severity score, so I wanted to see how that plotted as well. So the GSS stands for Gelsche severity score, and then it sort of had a similar uh, feel when we were looking at this plot, that the Gelsche severity score is increasing um, over the years as we're following these patients. And that the, the trend or the, the slope of the curve seemed to be higher. Um, between um, uh, in patients we have re actually recommended to start enzyme replacement. Okay, and then this is um, also just um, for my curiosity, I had plotted uh, chirotriosidase against uh, Gauche severity score to see if there was some correlation. So again, um, this seemed to suggest that there is a correlation between chitotriosidase level and the total um, Gauche severity score that we see clinically in these patients. Um, and this is a very busy side, but it's a very interesting one. Each box is a patient. Um, and um, we, I was just trying to see visually um, whether we could see a difference in the trend of the Gauche severity score. So each dot represents the Gauche severity score of each of these patients at their visit. And there are two colors here. So the red dots are the, the children with the N370S homozygous uh, genotype, and the, the blue dot are the um, children with the N370S R496H genotype. Um, so you could see in general um, that uh, I did a, um, this line across, that the hash uh, line across is where the GSS score, the Gauche severity score is at three. And you can see just visually stepping back, a uh, majority of these children had a GSS score below three. So um, overall the group is very mild. Um, I put a little uh, marker on the four kids who were um, recommended to start enzyme replacement. And you can see compared to the rest of the cohort, their GSS score does the trend a little bit higher, right? Um, and then looking at the blue dots, um, so again, this is um, reminding you about the, the patients who are N370S R496, they're very mild, right? Uh, none of their dots have reached above uh, GSS score or severity score of three. So very mild um, condition that they have. Okay, so I know you, were, you guys were thinking, well, what about these four children that we had recommended to start and why were they recommended to start? So I broke it down here for you guys. So patient number 17 started on enzyme replacement at age seven because of persistent short stature that was below the expected midparental height um, and had persistent mild to moderate thrombocytopenia, mild to moderate splenomegaly, and also osteopenia on DEXA scan. So 
through everything, all the stuff that was going on, we had recommended that um, this patient start. Uh, patient 19 uh, was recommended to start at um, age 14. Again, um, because of the stature was below uh, mid-parental height and a decrease in height percentile at that time. So we have been following closely um, in these visits and then you know there was a change in the height percentile was decreasing. And then there was moderate hepatosplenomegaly. Um, and um, I have to tell you the, the moderate hepatosplenomegaly was um, not uh, terrible. What was really concerning for this family was age 14 is, is puberty or the start of puberty. And um, this family really wanted this child to reach um, um, expected height. Um, and so uh, patient number 25 um, was started on enzyme replacement um, at age nine at another center. And from the report at another center, um, the patient um, and the family were concerned about the growth delay and again, not meeting the mid-parental height and also moderate hepatosplenomegaly. And then patient 30 was also uh, recommended to start at another center due to concerns of poor linear growth and joint pain. So from, from this slide, you can see one thing that they all share is um, the concern of growth um, and linear growth. Um, and um, so that's a, a commonality that we have been able to, to pick, pick out from these four children. Um, it is important, I want to say a, just a quick note that, again, we're not just saying height here, but th there had to be other things involved for the family and the clinician to both make that decision to make the leap and say, okay, let's start enzyme replacement. And it's usually not just the one visit, it's usually subsequent visits. Um, and so, you know, uh, and, and that's important for all, all of us to consider when we're talking with our um, teams and, and our family and, um, you know, it's never an easy decision to start enzyme replacement. I think, it, you know, given all the uh, concerns, you know, these are school-aged children, right? So there's school and schedules and, and then it's changing the life of that child. It's um, starting an, an IV therapy for life. So this is not an easy decision by any means and, and there's a lot of discussion that needs to go into it, a lot of things that we have to do to make us, to push us as, as physicians and push us as parents to make that decision, right? Okay, so um, the other thing um, we've been doing because you know the major concern is height. Um, we wanted to make sure that there's nothing else besides their Gaucher disease con that's contributing to the decreased in height expectations. And so we sent these children first to an endocrinology consult to rule out any other causes of, of short stature. Um, and because if, you, if you're saying that you're gonna start enzyme replacement and we want to expect and um, improvement in high percentile, we want to make sure that we are treating the right cause. Um, so, so really, this is an important thing that we do before we start enzyme replacement to make sure that there's nothing else at play. Okay, so a quick summary. For children with um, N370S homozygotes and for children who are N370S R496H, um, we can say comfortably that yearly screening with an exam, CBC, Kaido, and abdominal in imaging, and then every other year with a Dexacan, it seemed adequate. We were able to pick up these children as they're developing their symptoms, and we're able to recommend treatment in a timely fashion. Um, the majority of these children will not display um, um, any signs or symptoms, or only few symptoms of Gaucher disease in childhood and a majority um, will not need treatment um, in childhood. So hopefully we're able to start to answer some of these questions um, that um, these carrier couples, these fans are bringing to us. Um, and the, you know, just want to summarize, the first sign of disease in the, um, these group of patients seem to be uh, that, that they're not meeting the mid-parental height expectations. Um, the next step was mild osteopenia, and the last um, that we were able to pick up was mild uh, splenomegaly. Okay, and then um, I just want to put it out there because you know everybody wants to say you know uh, you know 
when should we start? Is there a particular number? And there isn't, but I would have to say, looking at our, our um, 38 patients and then comparing the four that were started on the enzyme, um, and then looking at those dots, it does seem that you know perhaps Kaido and Gaucher's severity score may help in, in how we see the patient as a whole and make that decision. Okay, and then of course we have limitations, right? Um, this is a very small group of children who are, uh, whose genotype is very, very similar, so very homogeneous. Um, and there is an ascertainment bias. These are cohort children whose parents underwent carrier screening. So then we're not picking up um, the rare, rare variants. So um, when we are doing prenatal carrier screening, it's called genotyping, and the lab is only picking up um, very specific mutations that have been seen over and over again in the population. So they're not looking at the entire gene here, right? So we're going to be, um, because of this, we're, all, we're, we're only picking up um, uh, through these methods carrier couples who have these uh, mutations and not more rare ones. So um, we do not have, um, the other thing I find interesting is that we don't have any presymptomatic children with genotype predicted to be more severe. So this is your N370S, 84GG, and other uh, compound heterozygous combinations. So I can't really say what, how these children and their followers are, are going to be, but in general, I would expect these children to be more severe and present earlier than, than the data that I presented. Um, and it's curious why we're not seeing that. It could very well be just there's a preponderance of N370S alleles in, in New York City area. Uh, um, I, I don't know. Um, but what I, I think what I love about this cohort, it is homogeneous. We could say a good amount of information about people who are homozygous for N370S homozygous. Um, N370S homozygous. And I think um, then that will hopefully drive um, um, the way we follow these particular patients, but also, you know, it, you know, highlights the need that we need to follow uh, children who are N370S plus other alleles in a similar fashion so that we can be more informative for all our patients going forward. Um, and so we really need, you know, concise but large um, group of patients and children followed from the beginning um, with very similar genotypes. And I don't know how we're going to be able to do that, um, but um, newborn screening is coming along, as some of you guys have heard, um, with, um, within four states, and perhaps that might be a way in which we could find out more information for you guys. Okay. And then there is a wide variety, uh, variability of chido triadase amongst children in the same group and also within the same family. Um, so we do see that. And, um, and we don't know um, whether there's going to be better markers, biomarkers out there, hopefully. I know um, a lot of people are looking at this particular one. It's called Lysol GL1, but it's still in the very early phases. And, and, um, and so we'll, that's to be determined. Um, and not all children are able to undergo uh, the recommended assessments because, you know, we, we're very practical in the sense that we don't like to draw too many attempts. Um, if the first time we don't get the blood, we don't try and poke the child too many times. It's, it's not comfortable for any of us. Um, the problem with MRIs, it does require children uh, to undergo sedation. So um, we try, try to balance the risks and benefits of that. Um, and there's no normative data for Dexacan in, in younger children and um, at some centers, including ours, we don't have, we don't do Dexascan below age five. So that might be important for not the N370S homozygous, homozygous population, but maybe um, it would be, um, it would be some data that would be very enlightening for um, patients with more severe genotypes, and, but we don't have that capability. Okay, um, other pediatric considerations, Dr. Lau had mentioned vitamin D. Uh, so we do um, measure vitamin D and we do supplement. Um, and then the other thing um, I want to point out, um, there is um, sometimes a concern with CMV and EBV 
Um, these are particular viruses that can cause the spleen to be quite enlarged. Um, in, in the older terms, we call this mono infection. And so if you guys you know, remember from your teenage years, if, um, uh, you know, sometimes people talk about mono and, and it can happen in the high school years, most predominantly or in college, but it can happen in younger children as well. Um, so I just wanna show you um, um, these four children who were starting on enzyme What's important to know um, that patient 17 actually had an EBV infection. Um, so I just wanna sort of compare this child to the rest of the group because look at his GSS score. It was elevated from the very beginning um, at age three it started because of that EBV infection. Um, and it's unfortunate. Um, and you know, so it seems that perhaps this is one of the reasons why a child can present earlier than the rest of the pack um, because of, of um, an EBV or a CMV infection. So if, um, if you have a child who is exposed to EBV or CMV, please contact us so that we could um, seek proper care, make sure that the liver and spleen is doing okay um, and that they're doing okay, all right? And then I, I'm sure we'll have that uh, question coming up, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Yang. Um, so we're running a little behind, and since we're so tight on the schedule, while we are having our entrees, cleared and dessert served, I'm going to continue with the program so we can try to stay on target. And um, I hope that uh, it won't deter so much from, from being able to um, listen along. So very excitingly, the National Gaucher Foundation has recently begun to collaborate with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And the Michael J. Fox Foundation is doing some groundbreaking work in terms of Parkinson's disease, but also looking at the GBA uh, gene. Uh, so for individuals who are Gaucher carriers, as well as Gaucher patients themselves. And today we're fortunate enough to have two physicians that are associated with this particular research out of the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Uh, one is Dr. Liliana Manalad, Forgive me if I've pronounced it incorrect. Got it? Okay. And she is, I only know her as Liliana when we, when we just, um, have conversations. Um, she is part of the scientific staff at the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, and her responsibilities um, include ensuring that the priorities of the foundation reflect and best serve the ultimate needs of patients. She stays closely linked to the Parkinson community and um, to help develop an aggressive and innovative agenda for accelerating research and drug development for Parkinson's disease. She leads the foundation's priority interest in understanding GBA, a major risk factor for Parkinson's disease. She received her pharmacy degree and PhD from the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Our second doctor who will be presenting with her is Dr. Rory Alcalay. Um, Dr. Alcalay is the Florence Irving Assistant Professor of Neurology at the Taub Institute and the Program Director of the Movement Disorders Fellowship at Columbia University Medical Center. He obtained his medical degree from Tel Aviv University in Israel, his neurology training from the Harvard University Residency Program at Mass General and Brigham and Women's Hospital, and his movement disorders training at Columbia University. His research focuses on biomarkers and genetics in Parkinson's disease and cognitive functioning. He is a Brookdale Leadership in Aging Fellow, and his research is supported by the NIH, the Parkinson's Disease Foundation, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and the SMART Foundation. So if I could direct your attention and ask Dr. Akhle Nanalad to please come up. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting us. 
Uh, we're going to be very brief. Um, the major purpose of, uh, my, of our talk is really to uh, highlight the link between Gaucher and Parkinson's and maybe uh, open up for discussion that will come up later. Uh, I'm going to be, I could have talked about the topic for hours because that's what I do for a living, uh, but it's really just a, a glimpse into the link. So uh, just very briefly, Parkinson's disease is a common condition, uh, different from Gaucher disease, of course. Roughly 5 million people worldwide, uh, the estimation is roughly 1 million people uh, in the United States are affected by Parkinson's. And it's the second most common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's. Uh, it's age specific, so the older you are, the higher the risk for Parkinson's. And above age 60, roughly 1% of all people 60 or older uh, have Parkinson's disease. If you look at 80 year olds, it's probably 4%. Now, uh, Parkinson's is most known for the motor symptoms, and the motor symptoms include a tremor, rest at tremor, uh, tremor at rest, which is a uh, very specific for Parkinson's, but most patients with Parkinson's don't exhibit the tremor at a certain moment. Uh, there is slowness of movements, rigidity, stiffness of muscles, and issues with balance and gait. In more recent years, the um, non-motor symptoms have um, received more traction, including cognitive dysfunction in people with Parkinson's disease, depression, anxiety, uh, impaired sense of smell, uh, sleep problems, including acting, acting out one's uh, dreams, um, up to 70%, if not even more, of people who act out their dreams, which we call REM sleep behavior disorder, will uh, uh, progress to develop a Parkinson's disease or a, symptom or a syndrome similar to Parkinson's. And there's also uh, autonomic dysfunction, which is associated with Parkinson's, which means uh, constipation or um, lightheadedness when changing positions from sitting to standing. So uh, we can think Parkinson's disease is associated both with Gaucher disease and with a carrier status. So the healthy family members that do not have Gaucher but carry the Gaucher gene also have a little bit increased risk for Parkinson's. What's the risk in Gaucher patients? The best study, the largest to publish, uh, that has been published to date came out of the registry and it estimated the risk for Parkinson's among Gaucher patients at five to 7% by age 70 and let's say roughly 10% by age 80. So still 90% of the patients by age, by age 80 did not have Parkinson's, but it's higher than the 2% in the general, one to 4% in the general population. Uh, when people queried their own practices, they reported 2.5, 2.2% of Parkinson's in the practice, but uh, we need to always adjust it for age because um, Parkinson's is uh, age dependent and the older you are, the higher the risk for Parkinson's. What was groundbreaking in the Parkinson's world is to identify that even Gaucher carriers, and which is a very common state, especially in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, is a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. We tried to estimate what is the risk of the Gaucher carrier to develop Parkinson's, and the estimations worldwide are very variable. Uh, a study in Ashkenazi Jews that came out of Jerusalem and uh, Mount Sinai estimated it at above eight, about 8%. Uh, uh, a study from, uh, the, uh, from France uh, looking at Parkinson's families estimated the risk in carriers 30%. So as, we see, as you see, there's a lot more that needs to be done in estimating what's the risk for Parkinson's and Gaucher carriers. And as in everybody else in the population, the risk is um, higher in people who are older and in, males compared in, in men compared to women. Uh, the risk in Gaucher carriers is also uh, higher when one has a severe mutation like 84GG and L44P compared to the more common mutation uh, N370S. So um, this slide would basically would say that there's not much, like that we don't know much about how to prevent Parkinson's, how to slow down its progression. People would often ask if enzyme replacement therapy reduces the risk for Parkinson's. We do not know that. Most of the enzyme, repla enzyme replacement therapy is available today does not cross the blood-brain barrier, and as far as we know, do not, does not de decrease the risk for Parkinson's. One would argue that because of the longevity it provides, it maybe puts more people at risk because they live longer, so it does a good thing this way. Uh, other medications, most Gaucher medications do not penetrate the brain, but because of the link between Gaucher and GBA and Parkinson's, there's a major effort to develop uh, compounds that will penetrate the brain and may help both those with Gaucher disease that uh, affects the brain, Gaucher type 2 and 3, and uh, the risk for Parkinson's in, the Gaucher, in Gaucher patients and carriers. Um, 
Currently, when we treat people with Parkinson's, uh, we do test, uh, at least at Columbia University, genotype them to test if they're Gaucher patients or GBA carriers. One of uh, my patients who participated in my study discovered this way that she's a Gaucher carrier. She planned to, camp to come today, but uh, had to cancel because of a family event. And I think the, uh, to finish and to uh, pass the microphone to the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the, um, there's a lot of hope in research. It's really changing the field of Parkinson's. We are very hopeful that by understanding the link between Gaucher and GBA carrier status to Parkinson's disease, we will be able to treat both this condition and general idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Currently, if you looked at the website like clinicaltrials.gov, you would see that there's three clinical trials worldwide uh, looking into the link between GBA and Parkinson's, for which we genotype people with Parkinson's to see if they're carriers. If they are, they're eligible for the study. And uh, Liliana will talk about the Michael J. Fox effort to better understand the link. I want to thank you again to Amy and Samantha for inviting us at the foundation. We're thrilled to be able to partner with the National Gaucher Foundation. And I also want to thank you, Roy, for always supporting our efforts. So I am presenting here on behalf of the foundation. I'm part of the scientific team at the Michael J. Fox Foundation, which is the world's largest non-profit funder of Parkinson's research. The foundation is dedicated to finding a cure for Parkinson's disease and ensuring that there's a development of new and improved therapeutics for those that are living today with the condition. Since the foundation was founded in the year 2000 by the actor Michael J. Fox, we have funded over $650 million in research programs. And these research programs aim to, um, they are aligned to our mission, which accelerate therapeutic development. We really want to run out of business, that's our motto want to cure the disease and close our doors. So the programs that we try to fund are those that are, for example, aiming to under help us understand what are the sequence of events that trigger the disease, or all actually therapeutic programs per se. These programs take place both in industry as well as in academic institutions in the US and around the world. And another area where we invest a lot is also the discovery of new biomarkers. A biomarker is a substance or a characteristic in our body that you can measure objectively and it's associated with the presence of disease or that changes with time in a way that is linked to the progression of the disease. For Parkinson's, we don't have that. And to evaluate therapeutic um, tools that can slow the progression of the disease, we will need to be able to see, to have a biomarker of progression, to have a efficient clinical trials. And with this domain of biomarkers, we have our largest initiative, which is the Parkinson Progression Markers Initiative, which we call it PPMI for short. PPMI is, our, is a landmark study for us. It's an observational study that we are the sponsor of that aims to understand, to discover new biomarkers or the biomarker for Parkinson's disease. There's over 1,000 individuals enrolled most of them have Parkinson's disease, but of course many of them don't have Parkinson's disease. And this is happening around 33 clinical sites all over the world. Again, the aim of this study is to identify a biomarker, to help the, with the diagnosis of the disease, to have better and earlier diagnosis, to help tracking disease so the patients can get the best medication associated with the presentation they have. And also to have more efficient clinical trials so we can be able to uncover um, disease modifying therapy. Now, PPMI is a study in which patients don't take drugs, but industry is very interested because they need these biomarkers. And there are 20 companies that are um, partnering with the foundation with funding that are helping us to move this forward. This is an $80 million study. The data we collect. Um, is around is our motor testing get so the patients undergo a battery of motor testing, cognitive testing, neuroimaging, and we collect also many different type of samples like urine, blood, cerebrospinal fluid, and all those bio samples then are analyzed by top researchers. And all the data we collect is open to the community, so they can mine the data and help us find biomarkers. And the last thing I want to say about this study is that within this, um, this, this group, there's a cohort of people that have, a GBA, have the GBA mutations. 
some of them have Parkinson's disease because we are interested to understand how a Parkinson patient with a GBA mutation looks like and how he progresses with time and changes his disease with time. And also we have a group of people that have the GBA mutation and do not have the disease because we want to understand what protects them. If we understand that, we think we can maybe uncover new avenues for therapeutic development. And if you're interested in learning more about this, you can check our website or call this number and everybody will be very happy to answer any question. Thank you. so very much. You can tell my height is an issue compared to many of the other presenters up here today. Um, before we get to our Q&A, uh, we have Dr. Pramrod Mystery here, uh, and I uh, had asked him if he would give an update for our audience on type 3 Gaucher disease and research that's going on. Dr. Mystery was born in Kenya, and he grew up in England. He received his PhD from St. Thomas's Hospital Medical School and MBBS from the Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine. Dr. Mystery's Clinical Research and Educational Activity Center, <clears throat> they center around inherited metabolic liver diseases and in particular on Gaucher disease. He began caring for Gaucher patients in 1988 and since that time has cared for over 500 Gaucher patients. He is the Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics at Yale School of Medicine and the Director of the Yale Lysosomal Disease Center and Gaucher Disease Treatment Center. Dr. Mystery proudly serves as the patient population, pr proudly serves the patient population through membership in the advisory boards of the National Gaucher Foundation and Project Hope's Humanitarian Program for Children of the World Suffering from Gaucher Disease. Dr. Mystery. Thank you, Amy, for that uh, very kind introduction and the opportunity to participate in this meeting. And I have to say, I think that this is a really momentous meeting uh, with a discussion on Parkinson's disease. And uh, I'm going to be talking about type 3 Gaucher disease. And as I was listening to the Parkinson's disease presentations, I was reminded uh, about something that Dr. Sidransky cautions that patients shouldn't be too scared about this issue because it's only 4% of patients with Gaucher disease who develop Parkinson's disease. But the great news is that so much research is going on to help and identify that 4%, and that is a sign of really quite an extraordinary evolution uh, of the field. Being here today, I feel I'm in my with my extended family, so thanks very much for this opportunity. As uh, Amy mentioned, I'm going to be talking about giving you an update on what is happening in uh, type 3 Gaucher disease, because the National Gaucher Foundation advocates and supports all of Gaucher disease, not just a certain type of Gaucher disease. These are my disclosures. And so the topics that I'm going to cover today includes uh, a discussion that Gaucher disease is really a very important global disease. Second, we'll discuss the long-term response to enzyme replacement therapy. And we have now data on children with type 3 Gaucher disease uh, that have been on treatment for 15 to 20 years and then discuss what are the big health challenges that these uh, children suffer from. Type 3 Gaucher disease remains a disabling and a life-threatening disease. There is progressive lung disease, progressive spinal deformity, and there is progressive enlargement of lymph nodes in the abdomen that can cause compression of the intestines, and of course, variable degree of neurological signs. There is now new hope for these families that suffer from type 3 Gaucher disease, and there is a clinical trial that I'm going to be giving you an update on uh, of a small molecule, the next generation of Sardalga, 
that can actually cross the blood-brain barrier. And so, as you know, uh, Gaucher disease, there are three broad types. We've been talking quite a lot about type 1 Gaucher disease, but these are the more devastating forms. The type 2 uh, that is recognized in the first months after birth, and it is devastating. These babies are very, very sick, often in the intensive care unit, and sadly, these babies do not survive beyond the first year of life. And then there is type 3. It involves milder degree of neurological involvement, and the onset can be in early childhood, and many of these patients survive into adulthood, even until their fourth or fifth decade of life. But there is a variable degree of neurological uh, problems in this patient population. So the story of type 3 Gaucher disease began in northern Sweden in this part, Norrbotten. And the, there, the first cluster of Gaucher disease uh, patient population were recognized by some pioneering researchers, Dr. Lars Svennerholm and his colleagues working in the 1980s. And they actually came and gave uh, a series of presentations at a very important meeting in New York City that Dr. Greg Grabowski organized. And that meeting was published as a book called A Century of Delineation. And that is a textbook on which I, I learned all my knowledge about Gaucher disease. And so many of the things that uh, Dr. Grabowski articulated in that book are still relevant. And so in Norbotnia, in northern Sweden, these were the kind of children and young adults there were. So these uh, were children, as you can see, very, very sick, with massive enlargement of the liver and spleen, abdominal distension. The other thing Dr. Grabowski mentioned is the cytokine storm. It's as if the body is on fire, and so these babies are losing all of their adipose tissue. You see how the muscle is wasted, and there's no adipose tissue. And sadly, these children died very, very young. But here is an adult who has survived into adulthood, but you see how that there is spinal deformity, and this deformity of the chest, uh, chest wall as well. And so this is a very variable disease in one part of the world, northern Sweden, a small community, uh, and there is extreme variability uh, from onset into adulthood and fatal disease in childhood to someone who is able to survive into adulthood. And you could see this even in a single family that had multiple individuals who were affected. So the most extraordinary thing is in northern Sweden, people give very good genealogy. And they were able to trace all of the individuals who were affected. These are the filled circles and squares with Gaucher disease, called the Norbotnian Gaucher disease, to one ancestor shown here, living in 1651, 1653, and even their names are given. And yet, the disease is so variable. And Dr. Amy Yang talked about N370S uh, Gaucher disease homozygous, and only three or four of the 35 children were affected. We see the same phenomenon of variability in what we call the phenotype or disease expression uh, in this population as well. So um, a, a very important concept that has been developed by Dr. Alan Sidransky uh, for more than the last decade is this, that really Gaucher disease is a continuum. So we have type one at uh, one extreme, then type two, the fatal disease at the other extreme, and so there is a continuum of phenotypes uh, with some of these main manifestations that we've been talking about. It is sometimes helpful for us in the clinic to think, think in terms of the concept that essentially Gaucher disease leads to multiple syndromes, 
even though the underlying defect is a single gene and a single enzyme defect. And so it is possible to recognize, for example, Gaucher disease and Parkinson disease as a specific syndrome. And the reason I say that if somebody in their 40s or 50s develop Parkinson's disease, you would expect they would have commensurately severe Gaucher disease, big liver, spleen, low blood counts. The answer actually is that there is absolutely no relationship. And in fact, somebody with very mild Gaucher disease can develop, present with Parkinson disease. Same thing applies to devastating occurrence of multiple myeloma in Gaucher disease, and so on. And uh, so I think it is very helpful when we see the patient in the clinic to try and understand the nature of the disease in the individual person. And for type 3 Gaucher disease and the neuronopathic Gaucher disease, already we can recognize distinct syndromes from the type that is evident at birth with skin abnormalities, and that's something that's been described actually by Dr. Sidransky and her, and her group, where these babies do not even survive the first day of birth, to then to the more uh, relatively milder varieties called type 3A and th type 3B disease. And so uh, the ICGG registry is a wonderful resource to look at Gaucher disease across the world, uh, not just in the European population. And what we've learned in looking at more than 4,000 patients is that if you have this one uh, N370S mutation, this is an ancient mutation that occurred in the 10th century in Eastern Europe, and it has spread through the European world. So it is very classically Ashkenazi Jewish mutation. A lot of us believe that there may be a selective advantage associated with this because the carrier frequency in Ashkenazi Jewish population is nearly one in 15. So if you have one or two of this mutation, that absolutely guarantees type one Gaucher disease. What I'm going to be talking about is this type of Gaucher disease. And you see N370S does not occur in the type two or type three Gaucher disease. It is mostly characterized by two or one, one or two copies of this mutation called L44P. What is interesting about this mutation is that it normally occurs in an ancestor gene of the Gaucher gene that is active at the moment. And so this gene locus is kind of genetically a little vulnerable uh, in terms of passing that mutation onto the active gene. And therefore, this mutation occurs in every population, not just in the European or Ashkenazi Jewish uh, population. And therefore, you would expect this kind of Gaucher disease in East Asia, in Africa, Middle East, and other parts of the world. And so the literature, um, uh, the world literature is pr predominantly European-centric. So it is focused on N370S mutation, which arose in Eastern Europe. And so 95% of the literature, I would say, is focused on type 1 Gaucher disease. The reality is that the biggest burden of Gaucher disease is due to homozygosity, one or two copies of this L44P mutation, which leads to the most devastating forms of Gaucher disease, uh, type, type 2 and type 3. And so we really need to address the global distribution and have a better understanding and offer something for uh, individuals affected with this devastating forms. And indeed, even in the United States, we have some patients with type 2 and type 3 disease. We believe that of the total Gaucher disease patient population, children with type 2 or type 3 disease are about 5 to 6 or 7 percent. So um, the International Gaucher Registry has uh, 
uh, done a number of important studies. The, this is a type of Gaucher disease where there are very few patients in single centers. So the International Gaucher Registry, led by Dr. Ed Kolodny and, and colleagues, uh, have uh, done a study involving really 131 patients to study what are the neurological complications that these children uh, suf suffer from. And recently, earlier this year, we published a study involving 253 children uh, who received enzyme replacement therapy with cerezyme uh, for up to 15 or 16 e years. Uh, and this study was focused entirely on children under the age of 18. And I'm going to just discuss uh, the key data from these two studies. And so the uh, Neurological Outcomes uh, Registry uh, involve uh, children with a mean age of three, three years, uh, and the onset of neurological manifestations was less than three years in about half the children, and uh, about 40% of the children had onset after two years. Uh, and this was a very similar cohort to the study that we recently published on the long-term outcomes with cerezyme treatment. So this is what Dr. Kolodny and his colleagues found uh, when they looked at the onset of neurological symptoms, uh, the age at the onset of each of these things like difficulty in breathing, swallowing dif difficulties, holding uh, toys, muscle weakness, walking difficulties, chewing difficulties, and so on, difficulty with gait, speech, spasticity, seizures, and so on. And what you can see here is that earlier on, the uh, neurological signs can be quite subtle. Uh, so it can take quite a few months before the diagnosis is established, and it is quite late that you begin to see seizures and very disabling neurological uh, symptoms. And so the natural course of neuronopathic manifestations was mapped out in this study. Uh, the early symptoms are shown here from birth to two years, and you can see there, uh, there is a prominent enlargement of the liver and the spleen, wasting, low blood counts, but in addition, there are a variety of neurological symptoms shown here. And then in the second phase of the, study, uh, of the disease, there is greater uh, seizure activity, myoclonus, spasticity, uh, and neurological disability with final uh, phase of the disease when the child is absolutely disabled. So, um, I wanted to show you a picture of this child that Dr. Grabowski, Dr. Kolodny, and I saw about a decade ago uh, in Egypt through our work on the humanitarian program. In Egypt, it is like the intensive care unit of Gaucher disease. All of the children are like this. And in his talk on inflammation, Dr. Grabowski talked about inflammation. You see, this is a picture of florid inflammation and activation of metabolic state. You see, this poor child has no muscle, no adipose tissue, and I remember vividly the day we saw this child, we walked away from the bed thinking this poor child was not going to survive another day uh, with this ex uh, extreme enlargement of the liver, the spleen, and how pale this baby looks. And so in our study, we found that children were anemic, their platelet count was low, but not incredibly low, but their liver and spleen were massively enlarged, and these children had quite severe growth failure. And so uh, we now have data uh, going on from enzyme replacement therapy for many years, in fact, and that has shown that there is reversal of uh, a blood, uh, low blood counts, the liver size gets back to normal, spleen size also improves dramatically, and there is an improvement in, in growth uh, parameters. And so this is him now, recently, uh, having had treatment. This is the same child who is now growing up. 
just goes to show that the enzyme replacement therapy can be truly life-saving and transformative uh, for these children. Still, we have challenges. So uh, when, when, you, when you plot this graph called the Kaplan-Meier curve, it's a technique to look at the survival probability with time, with age, and you can see that the survival probability at, 90, at five years is 92%, 10 years, 82%, and at 20 years, 76%. So this remains a life-threatening disease. All we've done with enzyme replacement therapy is to move the end point of the disease a bit further out. Yet, these children are looking to a life of disability and significant chronic ill health. And so these are the current challenges in type 3 Gaucher disease. Progressive neurological disease, which is variable, lung, progressive lung involvement, and massive enlargement of lymph nodes in the abdomen, and spinal deformity, as I showed you. And there is a type of type 3 Gaucher disease where is, there is involvement of the heart with cardiac calcification, and so on. So these are compartments of the body where the enzyme does not get through. Because when you have your enzyme infusion, vast majority of it goes in the liver, the spleen, and the bone marrow. There is no enzyme left to go to the lungs or the lymph nodes. And so in type 3 Gaucher disease, these are the aspects. And of course, enzyme treatment does not cross the blood-brain barrier. And so uh, we have a number of patients in the United States um, with, um, with type 3 Gaucher disease, and I'm going to talk to you about three, three children, and they are truly inspiring stories. This is the first child. This is uh, Stephen. He's now 10 years old, and I've looked after him since he was one years old. He was diagnosed with Gaucher disease at age three, massive enlargement of the liver and spleen, low blood counts, he had two copies of this mutation that I called L44P and started on Sarazyme at age three. His IQ is more than 130. He's at the genius level, though, approaching quite close to the, this. Currently, he's doing Singapore math, which is a very, I'm told, very challenging uh, curriculum. He has diagnosis of ADHD and autism. And in fact, recently, workers are beginning to recognize that part of type 3 Gaucher disease is a behavioral abnormality, uh, which, uh, which, may, uh, which is important to recognize because you can then treat these uh, children appropriately. So I'm hoping that somehow I can get this video uh, to just show you how gifted Stephen is, okay? Number five, indeed, up to 22, for moon volume. volume. Oh, you like it? Neuronopathic Gaucher disease. Just think about that. So this is a second patient, Thailand. And Thailand is now 12 years old. Again, I've looked after him since he was a baby. Two copies of the same mutation that Stephen has. And recently, uh, he started to lose a lot of weight after having done really well. And I just read a paper of Dr. Grabowski where he had described an unusual manifestation of Gaucher disease, which is massive enlargement of lymph nodes in the abdomen to the point that it can really begin to strangulate intestines. And when we did uh, Thailand's abdominal 
uh, MRI, CT scan, this is what we found. Huge lymph nodes which were calcified. And he has lost a lot of weight. Uh, he'd been on enzyme treatment since age two and has done really well, but this is a life-threatening disease and we need to fix this. Fortunately, the FDA gave us an individual, what's called an individual IND, to add in a Sedalga to his treatment in the hope that that medicine get, can get to the lymph nodes in the way that the enzyme treatment cannot get. And uh, hopefully, uh, we will be able to help this, this child. This is uh, Tylen. You would never guess that he faces mortal danger. Uh, and there are many children like this around the world and also in the United States. All right, so as you've heard, enzyme replacement therapy is a way to replace missing enzyme. But as Dr. Grabowski pointed out, the lipid that builds up, the fatty material that builds up in the cells of the body is essential. Without it, you can't live. It's a bit like cholesterol. With cho without cholesterol, you cannot survive. In the same way, glucocerebroside, the lipid that builds up in Gaucher disease, is essential for survival. And so the body has a way to synthesize this, and under normal physiological equilibrium, also have a way to turn it over and break it down so that there is a physiological balance. In Gaucher disease, two things happen. Number one, there is a deficiency of the enzyme, so the lipid builds up. But Dr. Grabowski had a very important piece of information in his presentation. He talked to us about inflammation. And one factor that was driving that inflammation was that there was increased production of the uh, glucocerebroside enzyme. And there is a convergence of data that is starting to show that in Gaucher disease, in addition to the deficiency of the enzyme, there is actually an increased production of the lipid that is so harmful. And so uh, when you have enzyme replacement therapy, uh, that treatment is directed to the macrophages and it makes up the missing enzyme in the macrophage system to achieve a physiologic equilibrium. With substrate reduction therapy that affects all cell types of the body, including the immune cells that Dr. Grabowski and his team has identified, it reduces the rate of production of this lipid to restore a new equilibrium in the cells. And so this understanding of the difference between enzyme replacement therapy and substrate reduction therapy is important for the evolution of the next uh, 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 level of therapy, not only for neuronopathic disease, but also for Parkinson's disease. And so, uh, as we've learned today at this conference, Inflammation is at the very heart of Gaucher disease. The, the fatty, fatty material, the lipids that accumulate in Gaucher disease are causing inflammation. A and this is a type of inflammation that is called the sterile inflammation. We normally know about inflammation as what you experience after you have a flu infection or pneumonia. Here there is no infection. It is what is inside your body that is causing inflammation. And it is involving some ancient immune pathways like the complement that he described. So inflammation increases the enzyme that makes more lipid, glucocerebroside, and this enzyme is called GCS. And Sardalga slows down the activity of this enzyme, GCS, okay? And so, uh, this factor that amplifies Gaucher disease can be controlled by drugs that can inhibit this enzyme, glucose cerebroside synthase. And so there are two substrate reduction therapies, and basically they're both inhibitors of this enzyme, GCS, as I mentioned, Zavesca and uh, Sadalga, shown here. And, uh, 
the difference here is shown in terms of these technical figures called IC50 for the two drugs. And that is a reflection of how potent and effective these drugs are in inhibiting this enzyme. So the lower it is, the better it is. So you can see the IC50 here is 0.024 micromolar. And for Miglustat, IC50 is 20 to 50 micromolar. That tells you that Sardalga is a very specific and a powerful inhibitor of this drug. And the other thing it tells us that uh, unlike Zavesca, uh, Sardalga does not have any other effects in inhibiting enzymes that are not involved in Gaucher disease. And so I wanted to show you uh, this figure because I think it is relevant to the broader discussion of type 3 Gaucher disease. This is a clinical trial uh, of Sardalga where patients taking placebo were compared with patients taking the active drug. And you can see the reduction uh, not only in the inflammatory lipids, the glucocerebroside, the primary lipid that accumulates in Gaucher disease, as well as this lysogl one you can see this really dramatic decrease, but also the inflammatory markers like the chitotiosidase and MEP1-beta tells you that inhibiting this enzyme, GCS, can reverse the fundamental uh, uh, pro disease process by decreasing not only the inflammatory lipids, but markers of inflammation. And we get this kind of inflammation and accumulation of inflammatory lipids not only in the liver and the spleen and the bone marrow, but also in the brain, where it has an additional effect in accelerating neurological phenotypes. And so uh, a number of the substrate reduction therapies have undergone clinical trials, and this is one where they use uh, Zavesca, uh, led by Dr. Rafi Schiffman uh, in Texas. And this controlled children who were stable on cerezyme uh, were randomized to receive either Zavesca or, uh, or placebo drug. And um, I think my, uh, here we are. This is the data conclusion that uh, Miglustat does not appear to have significant benefits on neurological manifestations of Gaucher disease type three. But the study uh, reported a very important signal in my mind which is that uh, it may have positive effects on lungs. And that led to greater decrease in chitotriocytase activity. That tells us that small molecule, unlike enzyme replacement therapy, is actually able to reach the lungs. Uh, and so for me, this was a very important piece of data uh, to be bolder in terms of thinking about small molecule therapy for type 3 Gaucher disease. And so these are the limitations of current treatments for Gaucher disease type 3, and therefore children in the United States affected with this disease and around the world are suffering. Because enzyme replacement therapy, more than 95% of the uptake is in the liver, spleen, and the bone marrow. There's none in the, in the, in, in the lungs or, or, in the, or to the brain. And substrate reduction therapy with Sedalga hasn't really helped us. So we need next generation uh, uh, Sedalga that can cross the blood-brain barrier. This is a seminal paper using Dr. Grabowski's mice where they developed the next generation Sedalga. And uh, in these mice, uh, with neuronopathic Gaucher disease, it reduced brain Gaucher lipids, reduced neurological symptoms, and improved survival. So this is a very important piece of laboratory data uh, to justify looking at this in patients uh, with uh, type 3 Gaucher disease. And so the LEAP start trial is starting now. And this is a, a trial of the next generation uh, Sardalga in combination with Cerezyme in patients with type 3 Gaucher disease who are older than 18 years or 18 years old. And the primary objective is to evaluate the central nervous system biomarkers in these patients. 
and screen, uh, identify patients with type 3 Gaucher disease who would qualify for extension, ex more extended treatment with this. And of course, with any treatment, you have to assess safety because our fundamental operating principle is never to do any harm to the patient. And uh, so safety will be evaluated with great deal of care. Uh, uh, this will be a rigorous trial. It will involve spinal taps, blood work, and very extensive neurological testing to determine what is the effectiveness of this uh, treatment. And there are a variety of secondary objectives. And those of you who are interested in this can look at this, uh, Google this on clinicaltrials.gov that gives a very detailed explanation. And these are some of the inclusion criteria. Uh, we are going to be studying, obviously, patients with type 3 Gaucher disease, but we also want to study patients with type 1 Gaucher disease and how they handle this combination treatment. And uh, these are some of the inclusion criteria with respect to blood counts, liver and spleen volume, uh, and it is important that these individuals are stable uh, on enzyme replacement therapy for at least three years. Uh, and um, uh, uh, women who are of childbearing age uh, must have a negative pregnancy test. Uh, and uh, it is important that any seizures uh, should be well controlled. Uh, and so the details, again, I, as I mentioned, is given in this clinicaltrials.gov uh, um, a website if anyone's in interested, but please do reach out to the NGF uh, for more information. There are some groups of patients who cannot participate uh, in this study. Those who've been on uh, um, Sadalga or small, uh, substrate reduction therapy, patients who've had their spleens removed and have severe liver or heart disease or kidney disease and so on. So this list is given here. We don't need to go over each of the detail. Suffice it to, uh, to know that this study has been designed with a great deal of care to make sure uh, that the safety of the patient is maintained. And moreover, after all that effort, that we get some useful data. So I would like to end in my last couple of minutes uh, by really emphasizing that it is important to conduct proper clinical trials for maximum benefit for patients to assess safety and effectiveness. You know, these poor families are very desperate and they will take anything. And I think that it behooves on us, you know, not to start recommending all kinds of treatment based on weak data or anecdotal data. In my opinion, that is almost cruel because you raise people's hopes and then only to find that there is no effect of treatment. And so the great thing is that there is a lot of uh, 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 a movement towards discovery of new drugs and new ways of treatment, but this should be done in a very disciplined way uh, to uh, obtain the maximum benefit for the patient. So among the exciting, interesting new experimental data that have come are the following, as I mentioned. So this is Dr. Brady receiving the National Medal of Science for, from President Bush for his lifetime contributions to Gaucher disease. And we are all here because of him, really. And forever, his passion was to have, uh, help to contribute towards treatment for patients with type 3 Gaucher disease uh, to achieve the same kind of transformative effect that he was able to catalyze with type 1 Gaucher disease. And in this paper published in uh, 2011, and by the way, he was uh, working in the lab only un until the last month before he passed away a couple of years ago, and this paper used a drug that is normally available in cancer medicine. They are called histone deacetylase inhibitors. And he was able to show that this drug can bind to the Gaucher enzyme. And then even though there is the mutation, allow that enzyme to get to the lysosome and function normally. 
And so th this and other work led to the concept that you can develop drugs that can chaperone abnormal enzyme due to mutation to make it work better. And so uh, there is more uh, work, again, NIH has really made pioneering contributions to this, and this is uh, the works, uh, this is a paper summarizing uh, the contrib uh, work that Dr. Sidransky's group has done, where they've developed really novel chaperones uh, uh, that are very specific for the Gaucher disease enzyme. And I believe uh, Dr. Sidransky tells me that this is entering clinical trials now as well, or, or uh, going through the process to begin clinical trials. So you're going to hear a lot about uh, small molecule chemical chaperones, and the idea is that these medicines go into the cells, find the Gaucher enzyme, lock into it, and allow it to function normally. It's a beautiful uh, chemistry concept. So I want to talk a little bit about ambroxol. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about ambroxol treatment. This is something that's available in cough mixtures in countries outside the United States. And so this is a paper from uh, Japan where they gave ambroxol uh, on the basis that ambroxol has the same kind of chemical effect in chaperoning as Dr. Sidransky's molecule that uh, and at the NIH it took a decade to develop those drugs. Uh, but in, in five patients, they felt that there was significant clinical improvement in these children uh, with, uh, with the type three Gaucher disease. And so uh, before I come to that, I want to say that, you know, uh, patients, uh, families that are affected with type 3 Gaucher disease, because they are so desperate and facing such terrible disease, uh, there is a great temptation uh, to uh, uh, contact their families and friends in Latin America, Canada, elsewhere, to get bottlefuls of Ambroxol and start taking it. And, and I think that it is important that we temper expectation uh, because, uh, you know, this kind of issues can really present very major challenges in taking care of a sick child. And as I mentioned, it is important that these drugs go through the same kind of rigorous examination as we did over 10 years with Sardelga clinical trials. Finally, this is a very interesting concept, in my opinion, as well. And uh, this arises from the idea that there is a, a lot of free radicals generated due to inflammation in Gaucher disease, and that you can uh, ameliorate uh, uh, organ damage by free radical scavengers. And one such free radical scavenger is called N-acetylcysteine, and in this... Um, a study from Minnesota, they uh, administered uh, N-acetylcysteine, and the idea was that it would uh, increase uh, the production of brain glutathione to relieve oxid oxidant stress. Uh, uh, and and uh, what, what is interesting about this study is I think it does indeed get to the brain. It does seem to increase glutathione levels and possibly reduce free accident damage. But this is research. We have a long way to go before its application in the human, uh, human uh, type 3 Gaucher disease. And so I want to end by saying that uh, uh, Brian Berman, Amy Blum, National Gaucher Foundation, we are dedicated to all forms of Gaucher disease, not just some types of Gaucher disease for more than three decades. And this is a picture of Ariana. Uh, and Ariana presented uh, with massive enlargement of the liver and spleen. And increasingly, we see these children, we can't decide is this type two or type three. And Ariana sadly has type 2, and with enzyme replacement therapy, she has uh, grown. And she's giving a lot of joy to her mother. She's very happy, uh, as you can see here. And we have to help 
these children around the world. And I think that the time is just rise, right to, to see a quantum leap in our discovery efforts for treatment of these children. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mistry, for such a wonderful update and comprehensive update for Gaucher disease type 3. Um, we promised that we would get to some questions. Uh, I'm sure we may run a little bit over the 3 o'clock time because we jam-packed our schedule today to give you as much information as possible. So I'm going to um, hand the microphone back to Dr. Mistry and um, have him moderate a panel Q&A. Um, for all of those who are watching live stream on Facebook, we thank you very much. Um, post your questions in the comment section, and I will do my best to also include some questions so that we can try to answer them for you as well. Thank you, Amy. So this is your meeting, so please ask questions. Yes, Robin. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, can we give you a mic, please? Can someone? Uh, I was wondering if both you and Dr. Grabowski could comment on the role of glucosphingosine versus or in conjunction with glucosreberside in terms of the inflammatory cascades that we're all talking about. Dr. Grabowski. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can we give you the mic, please? Yeah. All right. When the presentation of Parkinson's was given, there was one list that was that not normal C of Parkinson, not the sign. But they didn't say how it was identified if there wasn't a tremor or the other. They just said constipation, maybe a little dizziness or something. They never really told how they identified it with Parkinson's. Thank you for that question. So in a, in a meeting like this, everyone goes home, and because they are tired, they might have a little bit of tremor, and you get really worried. Are you starting to develop Parkinson's disease? So I want Dr. Alcalé to put this in perspective, please. Uh, Roy, please take a mic. So currently we diagnose uh, Parkinson's and treat Parkinson's based on the motor symptoms, which uh, the most common would be tremor, it's easily identifiable, but um, uh, shuffling of gait, slowness, when things take longer than they should, uh, stiff uh, shoulder, frozen shoulder can be all early signs. The non-motor symptom battery uh, often accompanies Parkinson's and help us make the diagnosis, but we do not make a diagnosis based on non-motor symptoms currently. Uh, it may help us in research that we conduct, both us and the Michael J. Fox Foundation, in identifying people that are at risk for the motor symptoms. 
So if one acts out their dreams or has lightheadedness when changing positions, and this is confirmed uh, clinically, maybe they're at a little bit increased risk to develop a later motor Parkinson's. Now, very practically, the drugs for Parkinson's are treat the motor symptoms. So currently, there's no reason to diagnose until the motor, sim motor symptoms develop. Um, but we do acknowledge that when motor symptoms develop, that part of the brain, 40 to 50 percent of the cells have already died. So there is an advantage, at least in research, to diagnose early. Okay. Thank you, Roy. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you have the mic, please. Wait. Um, I'm curious about um, a couple things. One is the, um, the Gaucher severity scale. Is that something that's just unique to Mount Sinai, or is that used kind of broadly amongst all doctors who diagnose? And a couple reasons why I ask this. Um, my, Lindsay, you know, my daughter, um, she, I'm pretty sure, she's patient number 30 up there, um, she, presents with, without all of the traditional symptoms of Gaucher in term, when I say traditional, her platelets or hemoglobin, you know, are normal, her biomarkers are going up. But at the age of six, she started having severe arthritis joint pain. And we were told, you know, repeatedly in our visits to Mount Sinai that that had nothing to do with her Gaucher disease at the time. And I know there's been a lot of since then um, additional research about inflammation with Gaucher disease. So my concern in seeing that GSF, because one of our big things that we're trying to do is there are this whole realm of patients now of children being do uh, diagnosed pre-symptomatically, if you will, based on their parents being carriers. And there seems to be um, a, a couple schools of thought as to when to start treatment. I know there are children who are starting treatment at two and three before they show symptoms. Um, Lindsay, you know, we ended up um, her biomarkers were increasing. She never had any platelets or hemoglobin, you know, issues or, you know, uh, some of the more typical ones. But she had such debilitating for five years joint pain. We went somewhere else and started her on um, the enzyme therapy, and it got much, much better, you know, after she was treated. And they did all this. Re and I also want to know, too, she clearly has some type of arthritis, inflammation issues. They did all the workups for rheumatoid arthritis. Everything always came back negative in terms of all of the inflammation, diseases, everything like that. So the only thing she has is Gaucher disease. And we know now that she's on ERT, it greatly helps her. So that chart, that you know, um, scale doesn't mention anything about inflammation or joint issues. So I'm concerned that there's not a full picture. And the other thing I know is so many people with Gaucher disease present so differently. So how can we, I don't know, I just want to, and, and I know it's hard, and I know all these medical professionals are trying to do their best, but I still think we're missing something, and I still think, uh, my sense is that if we know these children have it, and ERT helps, I would recommend, because people ask, when should they start their children, and based on my experience, I wish she was started you know, many years before. So just kind of a general thing, and I'm curious to see where everybody thinks of it. It's a very important question, Amy. Yeah. 
feel that, you know, those different medical centers and different practitioners, everybody is different too. Um, and they take their best practice from their um, clinic and the patient that they have. So I think sometimes um, it's worthwhile to understand the different perspectives. Um, I think our clinic tends to have a majority of children who are very mild. Um, and so the concern from part of my clinic is, is really, you know, we really don't want to start enzymes and when, you know, how, how long can we sit on this information until we can actually start? Um, and so I know that that will, your perspective is completely one and our patients have a best practice. And I think all, and globally, I think we, we all as providers say that, you know, um, when making decisions about management and treatment, we, you know, we encourage people to go out and seek special opinion, because I think that will then help with in putting, you know, data together from different perspectives and from different sectors and, and um, from different clinical experiences. Dr. Heather Love. are you feeling? So it's not just a number. Dr. Grabowski. Yeah, just um, <clears throat> let me give you a little perspective on how these were developed. Uh, I did not participate in the pediatric one. I did in the adult one. So you sit down with a, with a group of, let's say, six or seven experts in the field. And you start talking about what the most important things are that you want to find. And you use what's called the Adelphi method. After these pundits come up with these ideas of what's important, you go to the next level out in physicians who've had some exposure to Gaucher disease, and they then put in what they think are the, the most important aspects. And then finally, you get out to a third or a fourth ring, and the idea is that you have sort of a collective intelligence on what are the most important things to look at, okay? So you end up with this score. The, to me, the most important aspect of this is that the patients get to a, an expert center, get diagnosed, and really get examined. The score, even though it's imperfect, is actually a reasonable way to say, this is how things should be tracked. And if we're not doing just that, we shouldn't be in this business. But at expert centers, you really need to have much more detail, much more attention to things. Now, Inflammatory joint lesions like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, like symptomatology or signs in Gaucher disease, is, is quite rare. It occurs, but it's quite rare. And 
you know, you would think that if she had swelling of her joint and she had fluid and somebody tapped it and looked at the cells, they'd see Gaucher cells. Okay, they're there. But it is an unusual manifestation, so it's not surprising that it took a long time. These scores are not meant to be diagnostic tools. They're meant to be follow-up tools, scoring to see if things are changing inappropriately. Okay? Does that answer your question, ma'am? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Is there any relationship gender-wise, any gender relationship with how many children are born with the disease? Perfect question for Dr. Lau. So the gender relationship with, re with respect to having the children, is that your question? Is there any gender selection? Is there is none that, uh, as far as we know, I don't, and there's others in this room here, that there is no um, advantage or disadvantage. Uh, so you would think you'd see repeatedly um, a more predominant male or female affected with Gaucher, suggesting that there might be some kind of recurrent abortion of recurrent termination, uh, spontaneous. Um, of children of one sex. We don't see that here. Certain other genetic disorders, we do see a you know, predominance of one sex because the males are not making it to, um, to, uh, to birth. But, um, and I'm actually a neurologist, but as a geneticist? No, it's um, equal males and females we see in Gaucher disease. So I would say that the disease itself does not you know, put weight on, on, uh, on sex um, selection in, in utero. Ma'am, can I ask you why you asked that question? Is there a personal context to that? Nothing personal, just intellectual curiosity. Okay, thank you very much. I think there is a question at the back. Okay, so I have, I have, I have two parts to this. Dr. Zubowski, I noticed that you have a are our closest genetic partners. Why not chimpanzees? <laughs> I mean, because I think, I think you might get better data. And also, what's happening with gene, gene therapy? OK, two questions. Thank you. OK. Um, the reason we work with mice is that they, you can make a lot of them, and they're cheap. <laughs> OK? And, but, and, and it, you can genetically manipulate them very well. <clears throat> and that's very important. The other aspect, of course, in academia is that they're really cheap. And it costs approximately, at the institution I used to be at, somewhere around 50 cents a day per cage to have mice. And you can have up to five mice, females, in a cage because the males don't get along. Um, but. Uh, so that's one reason, but you can genetically manipulate them. But your question in, in terms of mice is highly relevant, and they are different than humans significantly. Not only, they're, they're m actually more different in the brain than they are in the viscera, but there are still differences. The brains are very, very different. Why not do chimpanzees, somologous monkeys or something? The cost is prohibitive. For the ability to do two monkeys and give them, do some either genetic manipulations or give them certain kinds of drugs would, would be a thousand times more expensive than it is in mice. It's enormously expensive. And then there are some issues around uh, the, the, let's say, the humanistic approach to monkeys because they are much closer, okay? But uh, it's really uh, the expense. And then the other thing is, let's say that you could make a gaucher somologous monkey. It would cost a lot of money, and it would take forever to get enough mice to, or, uh, monkeys to do anything. And you have to house these mice at $50 to $100 a day to keep these, uh, I'm sorry, not mice, uh, monkeys, keep them around long enough to mature to what you want to do. So that is the major piece. The other thing about this 
is some people have suggested, why don't we make Gaucher pigs or other kinds of larger animals? And the problem with that, too,